Welcome back, everybody. <clears throat> Let's resume our meeting now. Uh, Tony, perhaps you could re read the run the rule, and then we will go to uh, Jill Borno. I think is going to lead us in the digital inclusion update on item three point one. Sure, uh, Jimenez. Tony? Present. Carlos. Diep. Present. Carrasco. Here. Davis. Here. Esparza. Here. Arenas? Here. Foley? Here. Yemis? Here. Jones? Present. Ricardo? Present. You have a quorum. Thank you. All right, back to Dave, which I think means back to Jill. Is that right? That's correct. Okay, hopefully you can hear me now. We can. Yes, we can. Thanks, Jill. Yay. Thanks watching at home. We're on item 3.1, which is the city manager's report. Uh, welcome, Jill. <laughs> Thank you, Mayor. Today, we're gonna provide an overview of the digital inclusion efforts since our last major city council action on June 23rd. So these efforts are always a high priority, but have been made even more urgent during the COVID pandemic for many reasons, including the fact that the lack of digital connectivity and capacity isolates our residents from accessing critical services, inhibits communication and engagement, disrupts educational opportunities and progress and exacerbates existing social and economic inequities. Next slide. On June 23rd, City Council approved the Digital Inclusion Expenditure Plan, which allocated three different sources of funding to several projects, which we will review progress on today. The total value of the city's commitment at that time was $8.2 million. Next slide. Prior to the expenditure plan on May 19th, City Council approved the Emergency Digital Inclusion Fund process, which allowed us to quickly receive and disperse any donations made to the fund in response to the COVID crisis. So far, the total dispersed donor designated funds of about $524,000 have gone to the Allen Rock, Franklin McKinley and Rocket Ship schools for purchase of devices. Mayor Licardo and his team in the Mayor's Office of Technology and Innovation have been deeply involved in fund fundraising, so we want to thank them for that work. In addition, the original expenditure plan of go back included $1,000 for devices, which either refurbished or new. In discussions with the County Office of Education, this amount was recommended for disbursement to the Mount Pleasant Elementary School District. And then lastly, the city budget included a uh, coronavirus relief fund allocation for the Oak Grove School District per a request from Council Member Jimenez, also for devices. So as of last week, all of these funds have been dispersed to the schools. Next slide. The digital inclusion expenditure plan included a strong commitment to connectivity for our residents, especially students. In early August, through a partnership with AT&T, Nearly 8,300 hotspots were distributed to 16 school districts and the County Office of Education. At that time, this number met all requests. However, due to the first couple of weeks of school, um, many districts realized that their students and families' needs were greater than earlier reported. In some cases, they learned that other solutions that they had been piloting were less effective. So as a result, a new round of requests for hotspots was received, totaling nearly 4,800 hotspots across 25 districts and charter networks that serve students in San Jose. <clears throat> Next slide. The good news is that we received very positive feedback about the SJ Access hotspot device itself. The local education agencies or LEAs who are our partners report that these hotspots are higher performing, serves the entire home with multiple users, and only about 0.2% of devices have required any high level technical assistance. And most issues have been able to be resolved over the phone or through a simple reboot. Next slide. <clears throat> And now that the first phase of school distribution is completed, our plan was to move forward with circulating hotspots to other unconnected non-student households. First, we have reserved up to a thousand of those hotspots to provide additional student households until we are able to figure out how to respond to the new outstanding need. Secondly, to ensure that we're reaching households in need and those that are most difficult to reach, the plan is to partner with local community-based organizations serving vulnerable populations to circulate hotspots on long-term loan 
plus providing wraparound support to achieve full digital adoption. Next slide. Another key element of the city's digital inclusion plan was to support the convening of education stakeholders in partner with the Santa Clara County Office of Education to ensure alignment and collective impact. We are now planning a third um, in the series of connectivity, digital inclusion and access events hosted by Superintendent Dr. Dewan, which has been attended by hundreds of interested partners so far. Staff also hosted a special convening for members of the Digital Equity Coalition to ensure that the SJ Access program is rolled out effectively to our education community. Next slide. And then simultaneous to the hotspot distribution process, staff have worked closely with the County Office of Education and school districts to convene um, host convenings related to the SJ Access program. This continues with ongoing support to provide technical assistance, maintain the website with useful information and manage any issues as well as providing reports of usage on request. Next slide. The digital inclusion plan featured two major infrastructure efforts as well. First, to provide outdoor Wi-Fi to facilitate social distancing, promote public health, and provide high quality internet outside of open hours and to support distance learning. In some cases, we are also um, enhancing indoor Wi-Fi when it enhances the outdoor Wi-Fi as well. The approved funding for this project was $457,000, which essentially covers the equipment and the consultant fees. But on, upon further analysis, additional costs were identified for public work staff to manage what's essentially construction projects and provide standard contingencies, as well as the cost of increased bandwidth for community center sites over the next three months. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, actually make that five months, four months, sorry. Um, these added charges are covered by the funds that were already allocated by City Council for Digital Inclusion. The projects are currently completing design phase and plan to advertise for construction bids next week to start construction by October. Next slide. Finally, the city worked closely with the Eastside Union High School District to ensure full funding for the Access Eastside Community Wi-Fi build out. This was the approved funding plan. Next slide. And the current status is shown here. Overfell is now open to the public. Yerba Buena is starting construction this month. The next three attendance areas, Independence, Entropy Hill, and Oak Grove were all subject to two RFP processes, one for federal funding and one for non-federal funding, with the goal of having multiple consultants available to do the design work. The RFP closes tomorrow, Wednesday, September 2nd. And then next slide. <clears throat> As we push forward to meet the digital access needs of our communities, our next steps include quickly pursuing funding options for acquiring more hotspots for our school partners, continuing our direct technical support to families and schools, continuing to distribute any emergency donations from the Digital Inclusion Fund, Initiating, initiating construction of Wi-Fi enhancements at city facilities, completing the Yerba Buena attendance area build out and selecting a vendor for the next three attendance areas in Access East Side, and the finalization of the MOU between East Side uh, Union High School District and the East Side Alliance schools that impacts the overall funding for several attendance areas. That concludes the update. Um, I am here for questions as well as uh, members of the Digital Inclusion Branch and our partners in Public Works. We just have a couple of slides at the very end here that I'll conclude with quickly and then we will open to any questions um, uh, from the council and of course public comment uh, for the entire presentation. And I apologize for scrolling through all of these. I just, oops, mm -hmm. here we go. So, um, we have uh, no meeting next week and on September 15th, we will have no 3.1 update given the number of items on council and uh, to allow council enough space and time to consider those items. We'll come back on September 22nd with updates on concurrent emergency planning for uh, other events such as the power shutoffs, fires and uh, future work. We will also be uh, coming back with a, a deep dive on public health order, outreach, education, compliance and communication overall. 
On the regular agenda uh, at this point tentatively is a, a fiscal recovery update and coronavirus relief fund rebalancing where we'll be bringing back the status of the funds and an opportunity to rebalance funding to priorities. So I'd like to close, um, Dave opened with a, our unsung heroes internally, I'd like to close with highlighting one of our amazing partners. All of this work uh, is done in partnership with the community, with nonprofits, with community-based organizations. And today I wanna to highlight the work of Catholic Charities of Santa Clara County, which has been a long, long time partner of the city uh, in deep and meaningful ways. Uh, the mission of Catholic Charities is to disrupt the cycle of poverty and serve those in need to reduce the effects and conditions of poverty. They've been one of our strongest partners, excuse me, <coughs> Uh, with over 225 employees committed to the emergency response, 175,000 th families fed as a result of their efforts, about 55.5 million meals, nine parish drive through locations. Uh, Father John has been very instrumental in that, among others. 10 family resource centers providing food, formula, and diapers, those critical necessities for those with young children. 500 children in 10 schools, Franklin McKinley, supported remotely through Coral Digital Literacy and San Jose Learns and about $4 million in direct rental assistance, which they have distributed. Additionally, they've been providing a virtual senior wellness support and convening the bridge to recovery efforts to look at workforce and job training opportunities. So I want to thank both uh, the CEO, Greg Kempferly, and the entire Catholic Charities team for being uh, a great partner uh, and doing such great work in the community with us during our time of crisis. With that, we conclude our 3.1 presentation and are open to any questions, comment, or feedback you may have. Thank you. Great. Thank you. And uh, thanks, Jill and Jim and uh, Reagan and everyone who presented. Uh, we'll now turn to public comment. We're on 3.1, which is the city manager's report. Uh, please raise your hand if you'd like to speak. Mark, welcome. Let me interrupt, Mark. Um, we're going to have a very long meeting tonight. I expect we will go to midnight uh, because of the substantial nature of what we've got on the calendar. So for that reason, we're going to limit public comment on all items to one minute. So hopefully we can get all of our work done before midnight. Thank you for understanding. Welcome, Mark. Mark, are you able to unmute your device? Mark, uh, we're not able to hear you yet. There you go. I, I apologize. Um, I wanted to comment on the uh, previous part. I don't know if I'm allowed to on the uh, on the uh, homelessness and litter removal. Yeah. That's and okay. um, I just wanted to say that uh, I really appreciate the city's effort to address these problems. And but I want to remind the city that there are areas in the city which are dumping hotspots, which are not homeless camps and are not greatly affected by the homeless camps, but we still continue to have a large amount of illegal dumping that occur here. And I just wanna make sure that in the city's efforts to address these issues, that neighborhoods like my own Buena Vista don't get neglected and forgotten uh, as a result of the efforts to address other issues. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Molly, welcome. Hello, my name is Molly McLeod. A um, couple thoughts regarding the COVID-19 response. Um, one, still looking forward to seeing updates to the SV Strong and the City of San Jose's local assistance website no reference to people with disabilities or people who can't travel less than one mile. There's a lot of folks living independently. Um, not everybody's connected with SVILC. Um, next thing would be um, reaching out to Dakara. One of the tweets that I did from last Tuesday had a response from this deaf, deaf um, community saying, we're here, we're happy to be involved. I don't think that outreach has happened. Um, good news is um, moving outdoors is a great idea. Make sure it's ADA um, compliant. Uh, my friend Michelle is still looking forward to getting a response back because other cities like Boston are able to do the alfresco dining while still including accessibility. 
thank you for your uh, attention. Thank you. Blair, welcome. Hi, thank you. Um, about uh, item, uh, well, first, uh, Paul Pereira is a good person to talk to about homeless issues. He works for the mayor's office. He's a good person. Uh, uh, about item, uh, our AB Bill 3088, that passed last night, 1436 did not. Uh, 3088 has parts to it that are a bit uncomfortable. And they try to somewhat do the same thing. But you know, people don't have to go through the whole court system mess that 3088 seems to allow. And you know, I keep talking, it is not the fault of ourselves at the local level. And we have to keep a really open, positive philosophy I'm gonna continually talk about. And with 12 seconds, please, please work on uh, the Vietnamese translation uh, language issue here on the Zoom app. Please make it say Vietnamese. I don't think it should be that difficult or complicated. Thank you. Thank you. Tim McRae. Thank you. Uh, I'm Tim McRae. I've been on the board for the Keep Coyote Creek Beautiful organization for a couple of years now. I'm now the board president and I wanted to speak on their behalf. We're dedicated to the mission of a healthy, vibrant watershed for all to use. And uh, on the questions of homelessness, we think it's not the solution for the homeless to live along the creek. Uh, it's not healthy or safe for them or the community or the habitat of the creek. Now, there are a lot of things that have been discussed today that we recognize are and in the issue of homelessness generally, there are larger, more complicated questions uh, that both the council and various advocacy groups are attempting to solve. Uh, I'm speaking today to note that we want to be a part of that solution. Uh, addressing the root cause of the homelessness problem. And we look forward to working with the city and housing advocacy groups on this knotty problem going forward. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Uh, Deb? Just upgrade her. Uh, Deb, uh, we have a problem. It appears that on your side, the software that you've downloaded is not the most recent version. So Deb, if you could download this free software uh, or the, the app from, from Zoom. Just re-download the most recent version, and then you'll be able to join us. Uh, Justin Mamura, Justin, thank you for all the great work you do out on the streets and in the creeks of our city. My pleasure. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Council. Uh, worked with most of the council districts there. My name is Justin. I am the founder of the Trash Box. Been going strong for about three years now, and despite COVID nineteen, we are still out there cleaning up the trash. I just wanted to um, just want to let you guys know. Uh, highly, highly support um, the Beautify San Jose initiative, especially with Olympia and her team at the anti-graffiti, anti-litter program. Uh, when you're looking forward to budgeting for next year and the year beyond, I just wanted to give my support and thanks to her team, super fast in regards to email response. And um, if anybody out there wants to do something about cleaning up trash, specifically around the creeks, the streets, Team up with these groups like Keep County Creek Beautiful, South by Clean Creeks Coalition, um, selfishly our group. We make it super easy, but I just wanted to give my support and thanksgiving to you all. Thank you, Justin. I also have to give a plug to the Trash Punks. They're an amazing group. Really love their enthusiasm, their passion for the city. Uh, so please get out there and join them. You can volunteer on any of their cleanups, along with the other many other great organizations that are out there hustling as well. Keep Coyote Creek Beautiful and many others. Okay, so we are back to the council. And I had, let's see, Councilmember Spars, I had her hand up for a moment, but oh, I'm sorry, it looks like there's one more member of the public. Sarah sorry. Keaton. Welcome, Deb. Hi, can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Okay, wonderful. Thank you for the opportunity to share my thoughts on the item. Um, I've had the opportunity to work with the Beautify SJ team and the anti-litter team for six years now and have only good, good things to say about them. I also wanted to let you know that parks are one of the city's greatest assets and I support increasing the funding for Beautify SJ to expand their services and to provide relief from the trash that clogs the city streets, neighborhoods, parks, and waterways. I've seen the dumpsters and additional trash containers at some of the parks as well as sanitation stations. So thank you for putting those up. But it's also been difficult to see 
the um, parks and waterways awash with trash. And this is also in companion with the tents and sleeping bags and clothes and PPE and solar phone chargers that the city housing are um, continuing to hand out. Um, also, the fires are continuing to ravage the waterways. So please continue to work towards the guiding framework that will achieve a trash-free San Jose, including the neighborhoods, parks, and healthy waterways. Thank you. Thank you, Deb. Thanks for all the great work that you do. Uh, very grateful for your enormous amount of energy and time. Uh, Councilmember Arenas. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, I have a couple of questions around digital inclusion. I know that uh, Kip uh, and Jill, uh, we uh, had a conversation about making sure that the sexual assault service providers and domestic violence service providers are part of the um, organizations that will receive um, some of the hotspots. Did I hear that correctly? Um, I just, I think I just heard it very generically, but I just wanted to confirm. Yeah, Thank in you. this present, yeah, in this presentation, um, we spoke to uh, vulnerable communities, and uh, but those service providers are definitely on the list. Awesome, awesome. Uh, and they're the the ones that you'll um, distribute the seven hundred the additional seven hundred. We're going to start with 700, and then as we know how many we have available through our relationship with the schools, we'll be able to potentially increase it. Yes, okay. Um, and then uh, I know that um, there's additional um, school need, um, and uh, um, just in, in the spirit of being equitable to all, I hope that you can consider some of the districts that have not received as much. And um, um, I know that like uh, the Evergreen School District may not need, uh, you know, very much, but there's still plenty of um, Title I schools. And uh, uh, of course that have um, a majority of uh, children who receive low or reduced lunch. Um, and so I'm sure that they can qualify. And I know that they um, requested a very minimal amount, like I think 200, um, something of that sort. And so I hope that you can consider them for um, future uh, distributions. Um, I know that our families, and I, I appreciate you talking about the hard to reach populations because we've been talking about them in the last, just last week, it was you know kind of the theme in, in our conversations, or at least I, uh, certainly acknowledge that, and um, and that these populations are are like the last ones to come into the line, if you will, um, because they might not have sorted out their childcare. They might have not realized that school was starting um, this way, um, and so these folks probably uh, represent a lot of those hard to reach populations. And so I appreciate that you'll be able to uh, consider them uh, for the future. Um, and uh, a question about just, you know, some, some, some uh, logistics here. I know Chris Funk is leaving Eastside soon, so how do you get that MOU uh, for Silver Creek and Mount Pleasant signed before he um, leaves? And, I, and it's not to say that the new superintendent would not be in agreement, but if we can get this done with Chris on, on hand, it would be wonderful. Yeah, I had a similar uh, panic moment, and um, our, our understanding is that Chris is on uh, the team for the rest of the school year, and our goal is to complete all of these actions within the fall before the end of the calendar year. Great. That's wonderful. Wonderful, wonderful. So he's going to stay on until June of next year. That's my understanding. Um, I, I don't want to speak for him, but that's what no, I heard. Of not. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, of course not. We can only hope and then knock on wood and 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 say it is so. <laughs> All right. So the the last question is I was wondering how we could structure the RFP to make sure that independence, Andrew Hill, and Oak Grove all happen at the same time with Silver Creek and Mount Pleasant uh, both right after. Um for the for the technical questions, I know that uh, Matt Kano from Public Works was going to join us, and Regine Nair from our Digital Inclusion Branch, who are really um, the Public Works uh, and infrastructure brain behind this this work. So, Matt, I see you're 
thanks uh, thanks jill and thanks council member if you, if you don't mind um repeating the technical question i apologize for that i just want to make sure i answer the right question oh sure sure i i my question was how can we structure the rfp um uh, with independence andrew hill and oak grove uh, for that to happen all at the same time and it was silver creek and mount pleasant uh both happening right after sure yeah. thanks for the question and sorry for having to ask you to repeat it again matt oh. kano director of public works the um so the rfps are out in the street and closing right about now for the designers that are going to support us um on this effort um to build out these networks and we for we're i meet with my team weekly on these projects because they're extremely important um, projects for us to deliver as quickly as we possibly can. Um, Independence and Andrew Hill specifically are on a pretty similar schedule, although Andrew Hill we are showing a few months after um, our, um, Independence as far as the completion date. We'll continue to look to keep those on the same path and so hopefully bring Andrew Hill in earlier along with Independence. Um, as we get the designers on board, part of the challenge too is the capacity of the design firms how many design firms are um, have expertise in this area. Um, right now it's limited and as our RFPs close, um, if we can have multiple design firms on, on board, it will allow us to move projects forward a little quicker. And or if the design firms that um, we do have have the capacity. And so that's part of the reason we're showing a little difference in schedule for Andrew Hill and Independence right now. Although it's possible that we can um, uh, adjust those as we get these firms on board. Regarding Oak Grove, um, there's two challenges there. One is the capacity of the design firms, that, um, which is one reason we are showing a little later delivery now. The other is Oak Grove is a little harder to build out because there's more fiber um, that needs to be installed and designed. So the design time for Oak Grove is longer than the other two. So um, regardless of uh, whether we can bring Oak Grove in or not, Oak Grove will take a little longer than Independence and Andrew Hill to design. But um, in, in summary, we are continuing to look at how to bring these in quicker um, uh, because we know that access to Wi-Fi um, is, is really, really important. And the quicker we can do it, the better. I appreciate it. And so you haven't decided, it sounds like, what which of those two um, strategies works is going to work best, whether it's um, a organization that has the, uh, the capacity to deal with all of them or to use multiple um, uh, companies to to um, uh, just make sure that this all uh, runs correctly and on time. So you, you'll wait to see who the applicants are based on what you just said. Correct. Got it. Okay. And um, actually, I lied. I do have one more question around this. Um, so we we heard that the, the county health plan is contributing funding um, because I know for the county side, the, uh, this program would um, and our, our efforts to complement each other with us um, uh, securing the hotspots and the county securing the actual um, devices. Um, and this would all help uh, telehealth um, ultimately for the county. Um, on the East Side Alliance MOU work, um, are, is there more funding available for access East Side um, because of that? Or I guess, and, and is there any more updates on that funding? Um, the 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 MOU with the East Side Alliance, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I um, I'm. I will ask Regine to um, chime in if she has more information. Um, otherwise, I'll say that we'll have to get back to you with that information. I wasn't aware that it changed based on a recent, um, some other recent factors, but we're just, we just don't have the, the detail on it right now, but we can definitely find out. Yeah, it would be wonderful to just hear if the county health plan is contributing funding since that's what okay. we to understand. It'll help facilitate all of this um, and speed things up, uh, certainly, and, uh, and then assure us that a lot of folks are actually connecting to their doctors that way. So that would be really helpful. Um, so I'm going to move on to some questions about, um, uh, and, and thank you so much, uh, Jill and Kip, uh, for your work on this. I know that you were all working on this item uh, pre-COVID and, you know, 
pre all of this, uh, and certainly you had your work cut out. And I know that you, this is like um, an intense uh, version of what you, your work normally would have been. Um, but I know that there's a lot of families who are really grateful. I can see it um, in, you know, in the uh, Zoom classes that my daughter is attending. Uh, it, it just, it, it makes such a difference when kids have the, the uh, access and the device and appropriate um, uh, devices to work. So thank you so much as a parent. Not, I'm not using a, a, a device on Lend, but I know that there's a lot of folks who need it and is absolutely essential at this point. So thank you so much for, for that work. I appreciate it. Thank you. Um, I do have some questions about the, um, the maintenance and the beautification presentation. I absolutely appreciate the, the, in, the work that has been done between public works and um, and housing and all just all of the departments to make this very data driven um, and, um, and, and to make it uh, a, a very effective strategy in terms of how we um, address this pickup and, and continue to keep our streets clean. Um, and so that's one of the things that actually I would just wanted to note and, and thank you all for, uh, for, for doing. Um, one of the questions that struck me was about the conditions of the, the parks and, and the trails that, that maybe um, some of these agencies are observing. And I don't know if that is somehow relayed back to us in terms of um, the damage to our parks that will require more trash pickups or more, more improvements. Um, just overall, what kind of damage or impacts are you seeing out there in our our uh, partners who are actually out there um, capturing that somehow and relaying it back to us. Councilor, this is Jim Orball. Question, just to clarifying, are you asking kind of the, the impact that uh, nonprofits and others are relaying to us impact specifically in the parks? Or I guess I'm trying to really understand. Yes, yes because all of this was really connected to the unhoused and a lot of the um, uh, encampments, but I know that encampments uh, sometimes uh, that match up with some of our community centers or our libraries um, or our parks. Yeah. Um, so I wanted to, yeah. to um, see if there was any um, ability or if there was anything that we were collecting in terms of the impact it has on our infrastructure. Yeah. Um, certainly it has impacts out there in our community and we're making sure to, to reduce that, but how does that impact on our uh, parks and trails? And yeah, I, I think what, what we've been able to do is just take a lot of different data sources and, and start to kind of integrate them and really see a broader picture. And, and what we're seeing is impact broadly across our city. The survey work we did was much more street-based. So the, the work that we're doing right now and what we did over the last two months was much more street-based. Um, we're probably seeing a, a more significant amount of the impact, I should say street and trail. Um, maybe I can ask uh, Sarah and Olympia to more specifically talk about what data we have around parks and the impact on parks uh, and any comment you wanna have on the trails. Thanks, Jen. Um, I think I'll let Olympia talk more specifically about impacts in the park. From a data perspective, we've recently just deployed a new data tracking tool that our partners, our service providers, will be able to access. So after they've been on a route that's been provided to them, they'll be able to submit a survey that answers a few short questions and takes pictures of the locations that they've been to. But it's really um, been set up from an evaluative perspective of trash and cleanliness. I don't know that our data points right now are targeted towards um, specific park conditions. However, from a qualitative perspective, I'm sure Olympia has a lot of really great information. Hi, so in terms of our infrastructure along our parks and trails, um, the Beautify SG initiative is housed in PRNS and we still continue to work closely with our parks division who really maintains and tracks um, damage and things um, that are directly 
related to infrastructure or situations um, or issues that arise related to infrastructure. If we find that there's an encampment that is having a direct impact on the infrastructure, that's something that we coordinate to address internally among the department and other um, programs across the city to address. But our parks maintenance team does continue to track the infrastructure needs of our parks and trails. I appreciate that. Ultimately, we all know that um, uh, some of these encampments um, wear on our libraries and our community centers. And certainly now that we don't really have an opening, you know, we, we're not opening. And so sometimes with a, a certain level of activity, there's folks who um, may uh, have their encampments further away from the library or further away from the actual buildings. And now we don't really have, um, have that in place. And so what I'm, uh, what I'm, I'm guessing is that we will see some, possibly some damage to, to our buildings and uh, the surrounding, uh, maybe the parks. We know that our parks um, have been impacted in the past. I just was hoping that we can, um, because I'm so impressed with the level of data that you are all gathering. I mean, it was very impressive. I just wonder that if we would be able to also capture that in terms of our parks, um, because when we, uh, when we need something for our parks, we, we don't really have uh, that information. I mean, you know, we have some of the maintenance and of course we have the audit later on that we're gonna talk about. But um, as we're doing this work, this particular work, I think it would um, be beneficial and if it wasn't too burdensome to add something that would reflect the impact to our parks and trails. And that way we can um, track it at the same time you're doing all the good work that you're doing right now um, with encampments. Thank you. Uh, yes. <laughs> Thanks. So, is, that, Sorry, is, that a question, is that a question, Council Member? I would, well, I'm, I'm hoping to hear, uh, possibly we can do that, or so, that's so, something that we can actually easily sure, add. Sure. Yeah, I, I'm happy to respond to that. I, I do think as we build out our data model and we have it be kind of more flexible and adaptive, I think factoring in all the areas where we're having impact from encampments is important to do. I think our capacity and our ability to do that, we will figure that out as we move forward, but certainly fully capturing the impacts is an important part of getting a full picture and fully responding to it. So I think, I think you're pointing us in the right direction. I think it will be a, a capacity and a priority issue. Uh, I appreciate that. Um, and and, uh, and the kind of, of damage it has um, really to a neighborhood because after a certain time period, uh, our community may not attend or visit those parks or visit those libraries the same way um, anymore. And so I've seen it in, in our community, um, especially in the Welch community, where um, our park is not um, the, 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 the family oriented place that we want it to be. Um, and so I'd hate for us to see that throughout the rest of San Jose. And so we're going to have to work towards re, um, refocusing um, the purpose of our parks and uh, community centers and libraries and such. So I appreciate that, um, Jim. Um, the, the other question that I had is wh what's the funding level for this work after January. So when the, um, you know, when the COVID money goes away, um, what's the plan after that? Yeah, what we would fall back on is the ongoing funding that we have for the Beautify SJ program and the rapid illegal dumping response team. And then the coronavirus relief funds, they do end at the end of December, December as part of the CARES Act funding that the housing department received, uh, the housing department recommended an allocation uh, to the council. So as part of that one-time funding, I think there was about an additional two and a half million dollar allocation that was approved by council that would be used uh, after January 1. Um, but I think it's fair to say that what we're gonna see this fall, we will see a pretty sizable drop off come January unless we can find additional funding. So we're communicating with the budget office now about the annual report timeframe and looking at what type of 
funding could be available January to June of next year. And then obviously we need to look at ongoing funding to consistently meet this need. I think what we do over the fall, we're gonna get a much better sense of what this level of funding is able to produce in terms of results and outcomes and conditions. And we'll be reporting that to the council at the December study session to say, at this level of funding, this is the type of outcome and result and performance we can get. And I think ideally present to the council a variety of different uh, service levels and funding options, and then let the council deliberate and decide what, you know, what rises to a priority level and what makes the most sense. Mm -hmm. I, I appreciate it. I think one of the greatest resources that we have, and we've used them, uh, this resource very well, is our volunteers. And I wonder how that's playing a part in what we're doing now. Are we, uh, I know that we're um, funding a lot of these efforts, but are we also integrating uh, volunteers into what we're doing? You know, I, I will let Olympia take a little bit more detailed look at that, uh, or deep, detailed description on that. Um, I do know that during COVID, we have had a stand down on some of the volunteer work we've been able to do because of from a safety and a protocol standpoint. Um, and that certainly uh, needs to be part of our overall solution. But I, I'll be very upfront. I don't ultimately think that is going to be the biggest part of our solution in this process. As much as we all want volunteers to be able to do this from a financial standpoint, from a community involvement standpoint, I do believe this problem is systemic enough that it's gonna take a sustained investment from the city and other partners to truly gain control of this challenge. That's, that's my kind of professional assessment of what I've seen so far. And we absolutely need to do more on the volunteer front, but I don't think that ultimately will deliver what we all want to occur. Uh, I agree, I agree, Jim. I, I think they do play a part in our efforts. They're certainly not the answer, right? Um, we've seen the intense, um, uh, efforts that uh, the whole team is is doing in order to keep our, our streets clean and they're um, and that's difficult enough so I don't think that for one minute our volunteers are going to replace that at all uh, you're absolutely right this needs to continue beyond December um, 31st but um, in the meantime I don't want us to lose some of the momentum that we built already yeah. uh, within our communities and within our volunteers because as we have all reported throughout our social media um, uh, postings is how much our, our community keeps a portion of our, of our areas clean. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Olympia, maybe you can comment a little bit about maybe where you think you can take the, uh, the volunteer effort uh, with safety protocols into the fall. So thank you. It's a great question, Councilmember Reynos. And as you know, I've spent the last four to five years really building a core of volunteers throughout the city. So our volunteers are really essential in helping us pick up trash in neighborhoods, around schools, trails, parks. They do a lot of that type of work and not so much work directly in our homeless encampments, except for a few organizations we work with. My goal is to get our volunteers back online mid to late fall. What we are doing is developing new safety protocols and really finding ways that we can bring people together. You know, in the past, we do a volunteer event on a Saturday and it has two to 300 people. We'll have to really look at scaling that down to make sure that we're safe and doing a multitude and a different approach to doing our volunteers. I will tell you our neighborhood associations and volunteer groups have been eager to get back out there. And we do wanna harness those efforts to help us, especially as it relates to trash in neighborhoods and along our streets. Yes, you're absolutely right, Olympia. And I think we need to continue to capitalize on um, the will of our community at this point where they're, they possibly have a little more time in their hands because of sheltered in place. So they... Yeah, so with the caveat that I'm neither a public health expert nor yeah. a doctor, um, the what we know about coronaviruses in general is that immunity is generally limited. So it, it's actually not a surprise that there has been reinfection. Um, what it suggests is that we need to continue to do everything we're doing um, and in fact, it just means that even more so in the sense that um, just because you've had COVID in the past is not 100% assurance that it provides immunity. 
It also suggests that when the vaccines are available, and I'm very hopeful that it is a win, that it will be more akin to a, a, a frequent booster type vaccine. Those of us who remember before there was a hepatitis vaccine, you had to get a gamma globulin injection uh, every three to four months if you were in the hepatitis uh, prone area um, in order to keep up your uh, immunity to, to uh, from hepatitis uh, uh, exposure. I think we'll see something potentially similar to that with um, a COVID vaccine or more likely vaccines where there will be a need for a frequent boost in order to maintain the levels of immunity. Um, so I think I think the bottom line, it just tells you that we're on the course that we need to be, which is following the precautions and the direction from the county uh, and making sure that we don't assume that uh, you're safe uh, is, is exactly where we need to continue, unfortunately. Okay, and, and with the state finally coming out with a, a colored tier system uh, to uh, you know track infections and spread and, and uh, let local economies know when we can gradually reopen, how does our, I forget how many tiers, we have like nine tiers at the city? 10, right? It's 10, bonus, 10. Right? Yeah. Um, so, so 10 is not divisible by four uh, easily. Uh, does, does our uh, ladder or our plan um, align well? And, and if it doesn't, uh, do we need to revisit it? So when we know that San Jose from a state level is in tier two, that means we're within a, a band of, you know, seven to eight in, in San Jose or something like that? Yeah, our, our, our levels align pretty closely and we're gonna be doing exactly the exercise which you suggest. Now that there is a statewide piece, our, generally speaking, we love to align our plans to some higher level uh, framework rather than just having to, to create our own. So the fact that there is now a consistent high level state framework, we'll take a moment and realign our plan. But basically our stages six, seven and eight, we're currently in six, align to the new four tier system that have come out and we see ourselves moving along with that. So we'll take a, a few revs and realign our plan so it's a little bit more consistent and clear and probably adopt the same coloring so you don't have to remove, remember two different colors. But by and large, the same approach that we've taken is now being echoed at the state level, which is to say, we're gonna have to go step by step. And until there's a vaccine, we're gonna have to be uh, have some restrictions regardless of, of how far along we are until there's a vaccine. Okay, great. Um, I, I wanna move on to the... the um trash pickup routes. And, and I want to thank uh, city staff for that. I think it's, I was very impressed with the data sets and uh, not, not only did, did you guys just go and, and hear uh, residential complaints, but you went and I forget what you used, but uh, truth finding or, or kind of tied it to the actual things and drove the routes to see um, what the situation was on the ground. And I, I think that I recognize that's a, a lot of effort on your part and, and I thank you for it. Um, I wanted to ask on behalf of all the council members, if you could get us the maps in our districts or even citywide those images so we have an idea of where those sites will be in our respective districts um, so we can alert and, and share with the, the residents uh, nearby. Um, and I think just to do kind of horizontal alignment because if, if I know that the city is going to regularly have uh, trash pickup or cleanup down along Cropley, I, I can maybe put my resources uh, to doing other sites that, that aren't um, caught up in this. So, so that would be my ask. And I, I'm kind of just want to raise the issue and kind of get uh, Jim's response or anybody really. When we do this, we're kind of reacting to where the, the need is right now. Um, and prior to COVID, there was an ongoing debate at the city about you know sanctioned encampments or, or where we, we move people to. Um, as we run these routes, we're kind of putting an amber or kind of accepting the encampments are where they are. Um, and that may not be the optimal situation. So what is, to me, there's a tension between addressing the needs as it is, and then also identifying where the ideal route might be uh, and putting the services there as a way of kind of encouraging folks to uh, collect or gather um, and put put their their rubbish along the routes that, that we think make the most sense. So it's kind of a chicken or an egg thing. Can, can you kind of go in that for me? Yeah, let, let me let me provide some clarification first. So what what Rick described was 48 routes, 28 by downtown streets team and Goodwill, which are the lightest touch. They hand out bags, they pick up bags, they do light litter removal, those types of things. 20 routes by California Conservation Corps, a little bit heavier work, a little bit more significant, more trail focused. And then about a, over 150 sites of our mo most complex 
uh, most significant encampments that have not been established into a route, their locations, their sites, and the level of response and the frequency and the approach is still being developed. We haven't gotten that to a level of kind of uh, dialed in nature that it ultimately needs to get to. Um, so I just wanna kind of give, give some clarity about really where we're at on the assessment standpoint and our response standpoint. Um, we can absolutely share the information. So we will work to frame that up how usable it is from a standpoint of, well, you're here and we'll work here. It, it may be, it may not be, um, you know, from, from that standpoint. So I think that's something that we probably need to communicate with you directly about what we're doing in your district and, and where you might want to guide volunteers uh, and, and the like. In terms of the dynamic nature, we're very aware of that. That is a fundamental challenge. And we know we're going to need to be dynamic to go where the needs are at. But I don't think that where we provide trash services is going to guide where encampments are at. That's going to be driven by locations that people want to encamp, ones that they feel safe and that they can function in and, and meet their needs. Or if the city decides to move down the direction, the policy direction of creating sanctioned encampments. We have, not, we have not went down that path. What we're doing is recognizing that we have thousands of people unsheltered and it's probably gonna be that way for a couple of years. And if we don't respond to what's going on, the trash conditions are gonna get significantly worse. So we will be dynamic, but if the council is interested in trying to guide where the encampments occur, I think that's a different policy level discussion. And what we're talking about is trying to recognize where they're at and be responsive to keep them safe from a hygiene standpoint, and then as clean as possible from a trash and pickup standpoint. And hopefully that was helpful council member. Um, if I missed something or was confusing, uh, maybe one of the other staff members could jump in on that as well. But I'll, I'll just go back to you and say, uh, any follow-up question or did that get at your question? No, it, it, it did. It, and I had a few sub questions, but I think you addressed them too in, in your explanation. So, so that's fine. Um, the last thing I'll say is uh, to Kip, I, I appreciate the, the preview of the future weeks of what we'll, uh, what we'll be talking about in this section of the agenda. So we can put our thoughts to it ahead of time. So that was a good move. And, and with that, I'll, I'll end. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Councilmember Davis. Thank you, Mayor. Um, just a couple of questions. I first, I want to just uh, ditto Councilmember Depp's request to get the information about where regular pickup or re where regular service is going to be in our districts. And even even if it's not directly in our district, it would be helpful to have the whole map, since obviously, uh, you know, if it's something near near a border, um, that's information that that's useful and helpful to to our residents in our districts as well, because it is the, tr the trash issue is the number one issue that I've been hearing about. And I'm, I would be, I would venture a guess that that is the case for almost every council member, if not every single council member right now, that that's, that's the loudest um, complaint that I'm hearing. And um, so what I, I really appreciate the the response and the, the data-driven response and really trying to get this, um, this situation as under control as we can. And I also appreciate, appreciate Jim, I, I think I wrote down you quote a quote, something you said, it's a work in progress. And, and you were very clear about um, and realistic about the fact that I, I think what I heard between the lines is you're, you're saying, we're going to make a dent but we're not going to be able to make it completely clean. Like we just we just don't have the resources for that. Is that a fair characterization of what you were trying to tell us? I think it's very fair. And if I was in any way uh, dancing around it, I'll, I'll be direct. That's where we're at. But what we intend to do by December is to lay out as clear a plan as possible on what it's gonna take to get it to the levels that, that the council and our community want it to get to. But yeah, I think you've characterized it well. Thank you. 
And um, in terms of you, you did talk only very briefly about all of the other governmental agencies that have have property in within our borders. What what has been the communication thus far with them about cleaning up on their sites, whether it's our staff, our contractors, or their staff? What's the what's the um, progress in that area? Yeah, you know, we've had conversations and discussions and negotiations and cajoling and, you know, berating. We, we, I think we've tried most everything with all of those other agencies at some point over the past year, many years, what have you. Um, I think where we're at one, um, you know, we've communicated to them. We recognize we have to have probably a more systematic strategy with all of them. I think each agency has different um, kind of policies and protocols. I don't think the other agencies are approaching the public health crisis like we are. I think a number of them still are prepared to use abatements more regularly than we are. Um, I think we are facing the COVID crisis differently. It's in our community and, uh, and we, I think, coordinate more closely with the public health uh, experts to some extent. Um, so that's, I think, one different differentiator that we need to work with them on. But I think we need a, a broader strategy. Clearly Caltrans is probably the one most significant on that front. Um, but I think we've also taken the approach as a city staff, we have so many of our own properties and we need to get our own house in order to figure that out is significant. We know what it takes to figure it out on our properties. We don't think they've come anywhere close to doing that type of assessment. And if we were to take it over from them on their properties, we'd have to do an equally robust level of assessment on theirs to figure out what it would take if they were going to pay us to do it. Um, it's fair to say there's a lot of coordination and negotiation and collaboration we need to do with them. Angel has done a lot with Union Pacific. Uh, we will pick it up with Caltrans, um, but I also have to be clear that figuring everything out on our properties, if we're gonna divert and really work the other agencies, that will divert what we have today. So either I need an additional small team to work that, or I'm going to defer or divert from our current effort on city properties. Because we've all worked Caltrans, UP, the county, VTA, we've done that all over the years. Um, there's certainly more to be done, uh, but it is not an easy undertaking. Thank you, I, I appreciate that, um, that detail. The, um, the other question I have is for Kip, you talked about the new um, risk tiers for the statewide system, Kip, and but I, I, I didn't see anything about contact tracing, and I'm I'm wondering if you have an update on where we are as a county with contact tracing, whether with the new uh, blueprint that's not. Be, that's not that that we're losing focus on that. I, I still think, regardless of what the numbers are that are being measured for this, there's a the contact tracing is a is a infrastructure issue to keep those numbers down. And so I'm where are where are we on that? And then I don't I don't mean we the city, but the county. Where are they on that? Yeah, I'll just intro that, and then I'm going to hand it over to Lee, who's been in a tighter coordination with the, with the county and may have something to add. But bottom line, the county has invested an awful lot of resources into contact tracing, both in terms of the people that they've put against it and uh, the work on the process and technology side. So, you know, they have some own, they have some internal goals that they've been trying to meet meet in terms of the uh, amount of people and how rapidly they can trace them. I don't think they are. 100% where they want to be, but my sense of the landscape is that they've made significant, robust investments in, in that capability on the county side. Lee, uh, could you weigh in and add a little bit more, uh, perhaps some fresher detail that you might have? Yeah, and I would, I would just agree with Kip. I mean, I think the county has plunged an awful lot of resources uh, specifically into the tracing program. I will say with the new 
statewide framework, counties benefit from additional testing and, and tracing. Um, and so I know the county is continuing to push hard on meeting their internal goals. I think the new statewide kind of framework uh, better incentivizes that approach. Not that our county hasn't been incentivized. I, I would say on the tracing side, they've been uh, very focused on it. Um, but I do think the more testing and tracing under this framework, the better chance we have of progressing along those stages. So I, I don't think this would diminish any investment or effort on the county's part um, in that area. Okay, thank you. I appreciate that. And I just wanna note, um, I, I just looked up the, the positivity rate is 3.5% uh, in Santa Clara County, according to the state website that you, that you had on the slide. And our case number is 8.6. So we're actually, there's only the two metrics and you have to meet them both, right? So you can't say, well, we have one, but not the other. And it averages out <laughs> because we're at the moderate level for positive testing, but then we're at the widespread level for new cases. Is, is this system um, something that realistically we could, we could get to the moderate or minimal level in a few, in, a, in two months? Um, I bridge out a little bit of a limb here, but I think, you know, yeah. in the, in the way that the county has um, framed their risk-based uh, protocols, the intent is to the extent that you get compliance with those protocols. Yeah. You can pretty, you can stepwise work your way down the ladder, realizing that, um, you know, there's what a 21 days kind of between each step as the, the quickest that you can go. But, but my understanding is that their intent with their risk protocols that were put into place back in July is to be able to achieve the highest level uh, of, of certification, if you will, or, or, the, or the best possible tier if they achieve compliance uh, uh, and adherence to the standards across the community. Lee, anything different that you've heard? No, I think you, you hit it on the head. Okay, thank you. I appreciate that. And um, Jill, just a, a warning, I have questions for you. I'll take offline because they're not related to, to your presentation, but they are related to other library things that you're working on. So just wanted to let you know. Thank you. That's it for me. Thank you. Council Member Foley. Thank you. Uh, good presentations all around. Jill, I don't have any questions on digital inclusion, so I'm just going to move over to trash. That seems to be the topic of the day is uh, blight in our communities, both from trash, cars that aren't being picked up, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, abandoned vehicles, that sort of thing. I want to echo what Council Member Davis and Dieppe asked for is to understand the routes that we might see for the regular service when the service is going to be uh, implemented. Jim and Sarah and team, I really appreciate all of the data, but I have some questions because I feel there are some gaps as they relate to the smaller encampments. It, it seems our focus is, has always been and continues to be the large encampments, 50 people or above, but many of our areas uh, have small encampments of one or two people that are creating, still ha are generating trash that needs to be picked up. I know Olympia, you've been involved, you're meeting with my team tomorrow to talk about uh, one of my streets, Donna Lane, where we have, uh, my team has gone out and actually helped the, the resident or the, the unhoused residents there pick up trash, but then the bags are sitting there for weeks and no one's going by to pick them up. So I, uh, in, in, I have questions about the tiers. There are three tiers uh, and I may not have made my notes very well because you were talking fast. Um, one is about ongoing services that is regular service, uh, service, presumably that's weekly or twice a week or something like that. Maybe I could get- Councilor, let's do this. Let's pull that slide up. It would be one That'd be that great. Rick presented and it would show the three different tiers in the, in, the, uh, in the square. Sarah, if you could bring that up while the council member continues her, her point. That's great. I appreciate that, Jim. Mostly I'm concerned because all of these uh, identify or the tiers identified larger sites 
but what will be the service for the smaller sites or just the hot spots that are illegal being used for illegal dumpings? Yeah, so, so today, council member, we focused more on encampments and the trash and debris that's being generated by encampments. We also have a complementary program around illegal dumping that's not uh, primarily coming from uh, the unsheltered. It's being illegally dumped by people, you know, residents, businesses, et cetera. Absolutely. And our Beautify SJ team and this team, this uh, EOC branch that's been assembled will do a similar review of the illegal dumping and rapid response team as well. So that will be happening throughout the fall. We focused our initial effort around the encampment uh, uh, areas and, and that type of thing. But illegal dumping is certainly within the umbrella of Beautify SJ services. And we're gonna do a somewhat similar review into the fall, and that will be part of our report in December at the study session. Um, so, so clearly that is on our, uh, uh, you know, on our radar. And we recognize that also is gonna require education and enforcement components as well, because it's illegal dumping. Certainly our unsheltered residents struggle, and, and it's, you can call it illegal, but what are they to do? Um, whereas people who are housed or businesses clearly have options that they should be availing themselves. So there is a, an enforcement and education element to the illegal dumping as well. But coming back to the tiers that you're talking about, so tier one uh, is the areas that probably our smaller encampments can get by with a lighter touch. We hand out beautify San Jose garbage bags. We tell them we'll be back you know, in a week or two to pick them up, please use them. It's 48 sites. These are formerly homeless people um, that have been employed by downtown streets teams and Goodwill. Um, so there are 48 routes. They probably will be dynamic. Other council members have asked for the routes. We're certainly prepared to, to uh, get them out to you, but recognize it'll change. People move around. The, the locations of trash moved around and we're gonna to need to be dynamic to keep up with them. So how frequently we can get those route updates out to everybody, we will work on that, but that's something for everybody to wear, 48 routes there. The tier two conservation routes are primarily along trails. It's about 20 routes. It requires a little bit more robust labor. You know, it's probably a, a younger, more physically capable workforce with the conservation corps and they have more heavy equipment to be able to do the work. Not quite to the tier three level, which is city employees and heavy contractors with major garbage contractors, heavy equipment to get out large amounts of trash. We've located dumpsters now at the entry areas where hopefully uh, people who are unsheltered in those encampments can use them. The, the routing, or this specific service approach has not been as fully developed. So it, we really go in there and, and try and do a very intense cleanup to get conditions better. And then our ultimate goal is to try and get them more organized, work with the encampment residents and try and move them into a tier two or a tier one condition where a lighter touch can get a similar result. So it's clearly, as I said, a work in progress and that's how we're working down that path. Um, so it's clearly, we probably get more complaints and more feedback about the bigger, more problematic, more eyesore looking sites than some of the smaller ones, um, but they're all on our radar. And with over 200 of them identified just on our streets and trails, we know there are more than that. Um, and we know it's going to take a more robust response than what we've been able to do so far. We're going to ramp that up as much as we possibly can throughout the fall. And we'll be back to report to the council to say, how far did we get? You'll have an opinion on how far we got. And we'll have data and a very kind of technical assessment on where we got to as well. And uh, we'll factor that all in. And we believe that probably a level of meeting and communication with each council member 
through that process before we come back in December probably could be very helpful to understand your perspective so you can understand how we're approaching it in your district and citywide. So I'll leave it at that. I know I've went on a long time, but that, that's how we're trying to approach uh, those issues. Thanks, Jim. I, I really appreciate it. So tier one, just to reiterate, tier one is really mostly your smaller encampments, which is where most of my D9 encampments would fall into. I don't think I have any large encampments that are that fit the 50 category or above. So, uh, and I appreciate the real yeoman's effort you have to clean up the city. It, it's a huge problem. We're all generating tons of trash every day and to pick it up from the, the housed versus the unhoused, they're both big jobs, uh, but I can put my trash can out in the front yard and the unhoused don't have that luxury. So somehow being able to provide trash bags for them and maybe in dumpsters where you, where you are is really a good direction and a good option and, and anything um, we can do to help that out in our, in our city, we're help, happy to do that as well. Um, I think you've answered most of my other questions. Uh, I have been getting complaints about the 311 app not working as it relates to illegal dumpings. Is there, have you heard of a problem with the app? With uh, I, I have not on the 311 related to illegal dumping, but maybe Olympia, do you know anywhere it's still, Olympia, maybe just give a quick, your thoughts on that. Just a quick update. Um, there are some updates that we'll be doing to San Jose 311 to make it more user friendly in the next few months. Okay, good to know. So I'm not the only one hearing that there are problems with it. Okay, very good. Um, I think most of my other questions. Oh, question about cash for trash. Uh, that seems like an effective program, but the comment was made that it was at some location. So all okay uh, is that a monetary reason uh, reason that it's limited to locations or why is it how is it limited and and why is it just implementation so i'll take right. that one the cash for trash program um will have 20 sites we are currently working with valley water to provide more money so we can have cash for trash locations along the creeks up to an additional 20 sites as well what we do is use that strategy at sites that are the most difficult to get people to engage with us to help clean up. So we place a redemption value on the trash and that tends to get the area cleaned up fairly quickly. Okay, that makes sense. Great, so we're looking at our creeks, which is uh, actually a, a next series of questions that I have. The, you no, know, you we talk about our, uh, uh, our highways and our creeks and who's responsible for cleaning up, but there's a lot of uh, uh, finger pointing like, oh, that's not our area. Valley Water is really good at this. Uh, no, that's our air. That's not our area. We're not going to go there. The city of San Jose has to go there. There's all this back and forth. And, and Jim, I heard you say we can't take on everybody's responsibility and I appreciate that but we have volunteers who are ready to take on the responsibility of cleaning up some of our creek beds. And Olympia, you made something, you said something that kind of uh, caught my ear and that was about safety protocols. Are you saying that uh, we are not yet ready to go out and have our volunteers clean up our creek beds? When I talk about safety protocols, I'm really referring to group size, how we manage those folks, how we manage check-in and check-out, et cetera, in a very safe manner, and try to keep families and groups together so we don't have a lot of intermixing. So we're looking at going from 300-person groups down to probably 10-person groups meeting at several different sites in terms of our volunteer effort. Okay, just to make sure they're doing social distancing and doing what they need. Okay, great. That's what Correct. Uh, um, that's, I think that's it for me. I really do appreciate the focus on beautify San Jose, be it, beautify SJ and removing some of the blight in our community. We do hear as council members daily reports of 
people hoarding things where they weren't hoarding in the past, neighbors, you know, piling junk on the streets where they weren't piling in the, tra in, uh, in the past. So there's a lot of uh, what I see, uh, you know, I'm not a mental health expert, but it seems like there's a lot of mental illness going on as it relates to hoarding and then trash collecting with our housed and our unhoused people. And our housed people are sometimes the hardest to deal with because we can't just easily go and clean off their property, but they're the ones we're hearing, we're hearing from their neighbors as well. So uh, I look forward to having all of the staffs related to code enforcement and abatement and things like that fully up and working so we can start sending folks out there and dealing with these on house residents that are, are hoarding things. So thank you for your report and I, I really appreciate what you're doing. Thank you. That's it for me. Thank you, uh, Councilman Frost. Thank you, Mayor. And um, thank you, staff as well, for the really thorough report. I look forward to the opportunity in December uh, to be able to discuss what the next steps will be. Uh, my questions have been answered. I just kind of wanted to reiterate uh, the, I think the opportunity we have in front of us and really the extensive um, amount of work that staff has put in to map out this uh, this cleanup process, the the routes, uh, the different sites, the severity of them, um, that's a a lot of really good work. And what I would hate would I would hate that after December uh, we we get an analysis that shows um, you know how maybe how well we've done or what we could do better, and then how do we move forward? But not having the uh, the resources to be able to do so, and then have this work uh, fall by the wayside, especially considering these are um, uh, locations that are not uh, permanent. Um, you know, if we were to, to, to I think, let off of uh, the pedal on this work for even six months and then come back next summer, uh, the likelihood is that we'd have to ask staff to go back and, and reanalyze all of these different areas to, to map out, again, what the routes would be, what the pickup locations would be. So I think if we can find a way to sustain this um, ongoing, quite frankly, I've had a number of residents that have um, that have asked for there to even be um, uh, more of a priority focus, even a department, if you will, for uh, for the the cleanly, cleanliness of the city. Um, and I, I I really do think that this uh, focus that we've now uh, moved in shifting to not just serving those that are housed with a trash pickup, but um, serving those that are unhoused and recognizing that it, it really benefits every single one of us. And it is a major concern. I would say that uh, the only other concern that I get that is uh, equally, I guess, um, as loud from my community members is the fire hazards. Um, and in some cases, uh, the, the true fire da dangers that we've actually seen in, in houses that we've seen catch fire um, because of some of these encampments. Um, but the, the trash is, is, is right up there as a number one. And as Councilmember Davis stated, I think that's, that's likely what we're hearing from all over the city. And so if we can, can find a way to be able to take all this great work that staff has done and then sustain that moving forward. Again, everybody's recognized we're not going to be able to clear out uh, these encampments, get all of these individuals housed in six months, in a year, two years, in a number of years. This is going to be a long-term effort. The, the last thing I'll add is that, I mean, considering all the work that we have done here, um, the one thing we haven't done, and as, as Jim, you pointed out, um, is to, to actually flip the script where we're not just responding to the locations that people have chosen to encamp, but yet we are now directing locations, i.e. sanctioned encampments. And so uh, that would be the, the next step. I think we've gone through now a ton of work, uh, but what we're doing is we're trying to, we're trying to fit into this, uh, this environment that is migratory um, and, and put in a lot of work to do so. If we were to hone that in, and create a number of sanctioned encampments, um, especially now, essentially that's what we have, right, is these de facto sanctioned encampments because per CDC and county guidelines, we're not abating these locations. And so we're responding to them with services. Um, I think if we were to take that next step and say, well, which, which maybe of these sites that are already in, in existence or potentially other sites could we actually make as uh, short-term temporary sanctioned encampments? And then that way we know we would know the routes uh, more permanently. We would know the areas that we could serve. And maybe it's easy areas that are easier, right, to serve with dumpsters or trash pickup. 
And so that's uh, my hope for the discussion that we'll have in uh, December. Uh, as my colleagues know and city staff knows, uh, I have pushed and recommended for sanctioned encampments uh, throughout the years. I do think uh, that is a solution that we need in the interim. Uh, I recognize it's not a solution to end homelessness by any means, uh, but the, the, the impact that it's, it's felt on our homeless community, the impact that's felt on our unhoused community, just the, the, the environment as a whole um, is so tremendous when it, when it comes to this uh, unsanctioned, unmanaged um, uh, environment that we are allowing people to, to live in. And uh, if, if we can take these steps that we've just done and then build on them, I think that's gonna be better for, for every single one of us. And so I just really do appreciate the work though. I think this is a, um, a great effort thus far. I'm excited about the next few months, um, but, but certainly uh, anxious about what's gonna happen uh, past December. Thanks. Thank you, Councilman Jimenez. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. Uh, I, I think staff can tell very, uh, very easily that uh, garbage and, and, and the topic of today is really uh, important to a lot, <laughs> to many of us, and we, we hear about it uh, daily. And so uh, I thank you so much for bringing this up. Uh, I had a few questions and then uh, not really any comments, more than just, more just questions. But the first question is, D Dave, uh, I, I know you mentioned at the interim, uh, at the beginning of the comments, and I appreciate you acknowledging the memo that we that I submitted uh, really, the goal of the memo is try, trying to think of some of these services that were considered deemed non-essential and how we're going to sort of migrate those back to being essential. Um, and you said that it was going to come back to us at some point. Can you give us a little bit more information as to when you think that information is going to come before us? Um, yes, thank you, Council Member. And certainly, uh, I'll just kind of step back here. These, these issues are tied together. Um, so the you know but the, the what we've been talking about today and Jim and the team we've been utilizing resources from other places in the city. Those once we want to start uh, restarting some of the services that we used to provide, mm -hmm. we're going to have to reconcile the, the resource issue that we're talking about right now. Um, Jim, if I'm not mistaken, who who's performed the the surveys that we did over the summer? Parking and traffic control officers. So that was parking and traffic control officers, just as an example mm -hmm. of how we're utilizing staff here. And so this issue of sustaining the work, as Council Member Perales, uh, you know, correctly identified, um, we're going to have to reconcile that, our ability to sustain the work, and then restore services. And so um, we, what we do want to do is come back to the Council with that conversation, because I do think there are services that we have uh, incrementally over time restored, and there are still services that uh, have not been restored. And we want to be able to clearly identify what those are and, and what are the impediments to restarting or, or what are the resource issues to restarting because we're using those resources in other ways. And so um, I, I do think it's an important conversation that we need to have in the next few weeks. And so if it's not the next 3.1 um, maybe the one after, um, I think we'd probably be in position. I'm going to just ask Kip to weigh in right now because Kip is really organizing that with, with some others. Yeah, Dave, if I could just make a quick comment too. It, it was only a, a limited number of the parking and traffic control officers, just so the council doesn't, we, we have many deployed doing a variety of, of parking uh, compliance activities, not fully deployed, but, but it, it was a partial uh, allocation of them for a period of time. Yeah, fair enough, Jim. But I think yeah, the point is we're we're using resources in a very creative way right now, um, and ultimately we still have to reconcile that issue. Um, yeah. Yep, absolutely. <coughs> Thank you, Dave. I think it just to, to to kind of inside baseball. Good news on this is that we have a very strong team that has been asking and answering exactly the question that, that you've raised, council member. Um, we've created a process where we have a kind of a two week cadence where we are able to review requests for expanding services or turning services back on, making sure that they're in compliance, uh, first and foremost with robust safety protocols, making sure that we can staff them. And then the tricky part is making sure they fit in the other pieces of the puzzle uh, because the sort of um, 
three things that we're trying to do at the same time that we weren't trying to do six months ago. One is run the general emergency operations response, which, which we've seen from uh, everything we're doing, including the fires, just needs to be an ongoing effort. Two is essentially new services that we've never provided before, from feeding to uh, enhanced work around the homeless. And then three is the fact that uh, because of the constraints on the office space, just because for example, uh, a finance could do what they wanted. Well, there are other people on the 14th floor and the elevators are limitations. So we're making trade-offs around who can come back and who can't based uh, that we wouldn't have to make before. So bottom line, we've got some robust analysis on this. Kelly Parmalee has been leading a really strong team. We also realize that um, there are so many services that are needed right now. Uh, and we also know how to do them safely much better than we did three, even three or four months ago. So we're being pretty aggressive in this, but we're running up against sort of the, the competing constraints of those three. So I think we'll be ready by the next 3.1, which is the 22nd, to bring you forward uh, a comprehensive uh, chart that shows you where we are and we aren't. Also helps you understand both our thinking and our strategy and gives you a chance uh, to, to give us feedback and guidance on how we should be thinking in, our, in, in order to better meet the needs of, our, of your community and our community. So we'd be happy to bring that back and it's an important piece of work. Yeah, thank you for that. I, I wasn't um, thinking that we we're gonna have a set sort of you know in two weeks or it just, I, I think it's just important to kick and it seems like you've already been doing this but to kickstart the conversation about how we bring this city back to normalcy to a certain extent. And I know that it's a very delicate dance, right? You don't wanna be stepping on each other's feet as you're dancing, trying to transition into different different things. And so I'm very sensitive to that. So I, I it was by no means trying to, you know, expedite things and pressure you all <laughs> to get it done sooner rather than later. But I think it's, I'm glad to, to hear that you all are working towards, towards that. Uh, I would just say that as you begin thinking about what's, what's going to play into those decisions. I think it'd be good to, to get a, and I suspect you can get some of this from talking to, to the different council members, but uh, gauge sort of the level of concern uh, and what the community interest is as it relates to these type of things that, want to, that we want to bring back online sooner than others. Uh, I don't know. I mean, I have ideas as to what that may be, but uh, to the extent there's other ways to more probably, prop, properly, objectively uh, gauge that, I think it'd be, I think it'd be great. Uh, I, I agree and appreciate that. We, we tried to listen intently, especially to, to opportunities like this. We're also very open to direct feedback. If you've got particular services in your district that you feel are, are priorities, we, we will take absolutely take that into account in our decisions. We've heard things like, obviously, the, the work around trash that you heard today, things like uh, code enforcement, inspection, um, and, and uh, emergency vehicle abatement. All of those are feedback that we've gotten and are taking into account as we look at, at the service delivery. Okay, wonderful. Thank you. And then let me let me just ask a few questions. I think these are mostly going to be geared towards uh, Jim and the team that presented on the on the trash. Um, the one of the questions I had is uh, on some of the slides that you know you talk about the three different tiers and and the third tier, which is the more complicated tier. I think uh, that's uh, Beautify SJ with, and then it's just dash contractors. Uh, what I'm curious about, if you go to that slide, if you don't mind, I think it's probably slide like forty something, forty eight or forty try to keep track of the numbers, but uh, what I was curious about is the, for example, when, when you mentioned tier two or tier one, you, you, and I'll say you, but meaning whoever put this together, explicitly mentioned the number of routes or routes that were part of doing that work. But I noticed in the tier three, uh, you all just listed that there were 150 plus sites, which obviously there's many across the city that fall into that category. But are there are what are the number of routes there? Are there any routes there? I mean, it, what is sort of the systematic approach? So if you can see on that slide, right, the prior yeah. slides it showed the numbers here it just says estimated 150 sites. I'll ask the team whether it's Rick, Sarah, or Olympia to chime in. But Councillor, what, what what these are is. They're the most complex sites. They're the right. locations where we have the most level, the most number of unsheltered residents kind of congregating together. Um, and we, the, the level of work to get the site clean, given the workaround of the residents that are there, what they're willing to give up, uh, what they claim is their possession, say, no, that's not trash, that's my possession, even though some people might think it's trash. Those types of issues come into effect. So we haven't been able to specify and detail out 
the specific route, the specific approach, the, the specific parameters of the location to kind of get it dialed into, we can do it on this day, this frequently, with this precise level of service, we've got more work to do in that area to get that dialed in. It's, it's, it's a work in progress. And, and maybe I'll ask Rick or somebody else to chime in and add maybe something that I haven't added or a nuance that I'm not explaining well enough. Jim, I think you covered it pretty well. You know, another important caveat is the we talked about the 48 routes and the tiers one and two. That isn't that there are more sites within those routes. So as I mentioned, those routes vary in length from a quarter mile to a mile and a quarter. And, and there are numerous uh, sites, just like the locations you're seeing here, along mm -hmm. several of those routes. So that's that's an important caveat to add. And as Jim said, you know, the Beautify SJ team with its very limited resources, it's doing its best right now to um, to operationalize and manage the sites on the tier three level. We've tried to assign tier one and tier two to clear capacity for that team to manage tier three as we work through the process of getting procurements online to manage tier three. And a part of that, again, is figuring out how to operationalize it, um, assign the work, and you know, do what we can to to get us the results that we're looking for. If I if I've missed anything, Sarah, please. Yeah. Please. So, so 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 just so I understand. So my sense when you're describing this, and, and I'm not taking. There's no objection as to how you're doing it. I'm just trying to think through the, the rationale, right? So the sense I get is tier one, tier two, based on everything you've shared. Those, and I hate to sort of categorize it this way, but those are the easier sites to clean up, right? The more complicated sites or the fall into tier three is that a, that's a, correct yeah right? that's right and so and so but but tier three sites are getting attention just not as much and there's many more is, is that I, I think that's right and as jim mentioned you know i think we said 10 percent total of the sites have been visited you know once per week that's well, probably that's right and capacity issue not not a you know an efficiency issue really there's just not enough resources online so mm -hmm. so that's what we're really really kind of you know, making sure we can do in the short term is bring on more resources, you know, and kind of on parallel paths, try to understand more of what's happening on tier three, while also delivering services in those areas to kind of build out a longer term service model and provide you all with the information and the, the kind of proposal that we're talking about for December. And do you anticipate that the folks you're going to, because I think that the distinction that I saw as well as tier one and two, those are grants and tier three is going to be a contract <laughs> or, you know, it just seems like it's been being treated a little differently. And so what I'm curious about it, and it is, I guess, right. But, uh, but uh, do we intend to get different, different types of folks out there cleaning up tier three sites? Is that, yes, is that we, we do. Yeah. We're yeah. using downtown streets team who hires formerly homeless or homeless individuals to do that work. We're using goodwill industries as well. They're doing tier one. Tier two is being done by the California Conservation Corps and tier three is being done by city forces and professional heavy equipment contractors. Right. And, mm -hmm. and we apply it based upon what it takes to get the place clean. And clearly the tier one, it, it's a much more manageable, lower intensity, lower volume, lower weight type of job. And mm -hmm. Honestly, Councilor, we're going to evaluate the effectiveness of all three tiers and, yeah. and a variety of different service approaches to figure out which ones are the most efficient, which ones are the most effective, and to apply the right resource, the right service, the right location. That's what we need to figure out to make this as efficient as possible. Okay. Yeah. And, and, and then I think there was a number that was on one of the slides. I think it was about 1.1 million or so by December or so for tier three, the contracts that are going out, the RFP, right? That's about, correct. Yep. And, yes. and when do we expect that to be finalized? And, or, you know, for everything- we, The, the RFP is out right now. We're receiving, when are proposals due back, Rick? Uh, Mid-September. Okay. okay. So it'll take a, little, a week or two to finalize and get them, get them so signed. And so the idea that, that whoever gets that contract is gonna do some of this much needed work in tier three, Correct. And, and, and Councilmember, on that, we awarded two emergency contracts up to $300,000 right. in July 
to carry us through the end of September. The formal competitive RFP is to continue that work and do more of it between the end of September and the end of the calendar year. So this, it's, we're trying to ramp that up. We may award up to three different contracts for that work. Mm -hmm. it, it really depends upon the proposals we get and the, what we think is the value that we can get and the impact we can have in those areas. Mm -hmm. Would you say that tier three uh, sites are the ones that you hear most about uh, from, from residents? Or is it, uh, it's not, that's not necessarily the no. case? No? Okay. It, it, it's probably a range. It, yeah. you know, it, we, we probably hear about it depending upon the, the, poor of, the poorest mm -hmm. conditions, the ones that are most visible, or the ones that are by organized neighborhood groups. If there's an organized neighborhood groups, they'll get everybody on the email chain and start really peppering. I mean, that, that you know, we, we've seen plenty of that too. And, and another question I had is what was, I think you had indicated it was 150 plus tier three sites. Do we have a census to how, because there was a few numbers in there. I'm not sure if it's as easy as just putting the numbers together, but how many of, how many of these sites tier through, tier one through tier three exist in the city? And and I'm what I'm what and the reason I'm asking that is I'm wondering if we're counting property within the city that's Caltrans property or UP property, but it falls within San Jose. And if we're counting that as one. So of the on the slide we indicated that we're not counting those other properties. Okay. Uh, number one and number two, we did not do an extensive creek assessment. We weren't able to get down into the depths of the creeks, so we recognize those are two areas that are going to require more assessment to get a full complete handle on this. It's something we absolutely want to do. We're gonna put that into the work plan and figure out how we can do that with our partners and also assess the creek areas as well to get a complete picture of what it's gonna take. Okay, and I was very happy to know that, I think you said by the end of the year, bringing forward some recommendations as it relates to the amount of money that's gonna be necessary to you know, do, do this work, right? Uh, should we expect that you're going to bring forward some ideas? We then sort of point you in the direction we want to go, and then come budget season in July, that's when it'll be addressed. Or, or so. So a couple of things. Yes, we we're going to try and give you as specific an assessment as possible, so you can kind of see the data that we see, what worked, what what isn't working, or what didn't work, and why we think we ought to go away from it. But to give you a proposal that lays out, here's what we think. It's going to take to solve the problem and maybe it's solving it at different levels if you want a high a level service this is the approach this is what it's going to take you know if we can only afford uh, a b or a c level that's what we may recommend but we want to lay that out for the council to understand that uh, including you know more assessment and then what's working better and maybe what isn't working as effectively and, okay. and and just really briefly, we're going to need to look in the annual report to cover the January to June gap. And then, yes, we would be looking to look, make recommendations about long-term funding. Are there any fee opportunities available to, to make this work? Uh, what other funding sources? Do we have a variety of different options? So we'll try and bring back as much as we can on that front. Okay. All right. Thank you so much. Councilmember Sparsa. Thank you, Mayor. I know my colleagues have um, asked a lot of questions already, so I'll keep it pretty short. Um, so I wanted to um, go over the Caltrans issue, Jim. Um, so I have uh, a site in my district that we've been working pretty closely with Caltrans on to get them to come out um, and do some cleanups. Um, and I know that there's a lot of frustration throughout the city on this. So did I hear you correctly to say that if, if we ask the team to do this, it's going to pull the team off of this complex work that you're doing right now? I, I, would, I would characterize it like this, Councilor. I, I would say that we do some amount of coordination with Caltrans already. There's no question that Olympia, Angel, Rick through DOT, that we, we do with some amount of that already. That will continue no matter. But to really develop a comprehensive MOU, where we have an agreement, it, it, you know, I know there's a, a rules memorandum that's scheduled for tomorrow to try and develop some type of MOU with Caltrans to have them pay us. 
I know that would take time to negotiate, uh, time to assess. So to, to think that we're gonna be able to dramatically get a different working situation and a, a dramatically improved situation from Caltrans without diverting our kind of program policy level management team from what they're doing and have no impact on the big job in front of us. I don't think that's realistic. That's just me sizing up. I'm working with a very small team and I'm in there meeting with them almost every single day. We have Olympia. branch meetings. Oh, sorry, go ahead. We have branch meetings every day on this topic. So yeah. um, it's something we need to do uh, and we will scope that out, but I, I don't want to give the impression that this is easy partner and policy work that just kind of naturally comes together. Uh, work with Caltrans is, is you know, it, it's, it's, it's painstaking. Yeah, it has been for my office as well, but we finally were able to break through and um, and schedule some cleanups and yeah. um, uh, and there were some really uh, serious safety considerations as well. Um, Olympia, did you have anything to add to that? No, I think sp specifically for District 7, as you know, we've worked with Caltrans to address the Story Road 101 on ramps and exits there. So we'll be working with them to not only clean it, but they think they found a solution to prevent re-encampment at those areas. So we'll continue to work on those. But just in this environment, to remind everyone, Caltrans is not doing abatement unless they were approved by the governor's office. So even when we work with Caltrans, they have to go through a series of steps to ask to then have something addressed, whether it's an abatement or a lot of trash along the freeways. So it's something we'll continue to work on. But as Jim alluded to, that work is, work, is moving very slow at this time. Thank you. I think that's a, a pretty clear choice um, that uh, we have to be aware of because um, I know that this touches every council district. I know that I'm uh, one of the council districts that has to deal with this a lot as well. Um, uh, and this work, um, figuring the tears out and, and a more permanent solution, um, I think is critical. It's critical to quality of life. Um, for a lot of the neighbors, uh, neighborhoods in the city. Um, and that's kind of a segue into um, like the encampment on Story in 101, we had people running into the freeway um, with cars getting off and on. And so there were some pretty serious safety issues in that encampment. Um, I have some encampments, as you know, in, um, in Seven Trees very low income, very overcrowded um, community um, where encampments um, are growing at a very fast rate. And we have some serious sanitation issues that are impacting the neighborhood, right? And I've talked previously where I have people living in overcrowded living conditions, dealing with rodent infestations and other things. Um, at Story in 101, we had people running into the freeway off ramps and on ramps. And, um, and so I just wanted to bring up the issue that we really need to also look at the fact that um, there should be some abatements in some specific cases. Um, I don't want people getting hit by cars coming off of a freeway, right? I don't want um, neighborhoods um, dealing with some of the health, massive health issues that they're dealing with now. And so these are part of what we have to balance as a city. And when we take an all or nothing approach, um, it, it's somebody loses, right? And, um, and so I think that we need to start looking at that and, and start looking at what are the public safety and uh, health public health considerations around doing that? I, I think that's a very fair question and point, council member. Um, we did update our encampment protocol in the June-July timeframe to address if, if an encampment is in the public right-of-way, that we do have the ability to, to abate that. So that is something we can exercise. We have done it uh, on public right-of-way trails. We've done it in a number of occasions. 
The team is inventorying the number of locations where we have that occurring. And I think the number is growing. It's, it's a larger number and there probably will be a capacity and a timing of getting through that entire list. But we agree with you on that front. We also think there are probably a number of public safety and public health threats that could rise to a level where you know, in, in some rare cases where an abatement may be more appropriate and a better public health response than not dispersing the encampment for COVID reasons. But in communicating with county public health, they advise that we have shelter for the people to go to or another location for them to go to. And that isn't always something that we've had immediately available, but it is something that is on the team's docket to assess. So we are forming kind of a multi-department team and we're prepared to work with the county and Valley Water to, to go into that. It, it won't be an easy, uh, you know, quick thing to kind of resolve and figure out though. It, it's, it's another one of those things that does take a lot of thought sophistication to get it done right um, you know to because the the alternative of of pushing covid and spreading it that's a real serious concern so your point you're on point and it's absolutely on our radar and it's something we will be working on how much we can get done on that among other things is a critical issue um, you know that, that we're sorting through the safety issue uh, on the on-ramp, I, I will follow up with that one with Olympia and Caltrans. That that obviously is is a pretty serious issue. Councilman yeah, so Sparza, do you mind if I interrupt here? Go ahead. Okay. On, on this this very issue, because I'm actually in exchange right now with the governor's team on this issue, because I've heard that there's an issue with Caltrans not having authorization to clear encampments where there are obvious safety issues. And I just want to understand better, who gives them the authority? Is it HHS? Who has to give them the green light? So when we work with Caltrans, what we do is we put in a request to the superintendent of our district, which is District 4. He then goes through an approval process, which goes to the governor's office and the Office of Emergency Services, then approves and says we can get the encampment cleared. There are three sites that we have on our list that were only approved for San Jose. Story in 101, um, the Blossom Hill exit in 101, as well as 85 and Almaden are going to do some cleanup there. As those encampments tend to shift and move, we have to start again and go through that entire process to get those approved. So Cal OES is the one that gives the green light, is that right? Yes, Cal OES has to give the green light. Okay, I'll follow up then on this text stream because I think Councilman Sparza raised a really important issue that hopefully we can resolve in Sacramento. Thank you, Councilman. Thank you, thank you, Mayor. Um, and uh, also, I actually glossed over the uh, a thank you to the whole team, uh, to Olympia and Jim and Rick and um, the whole team on putting together this plan and presentation. It's tremendously complex, and I know that there are a lot of moving parts, but I also wanted to thank you on top of all the hard work, and Sarah, sorry, all right, um, on top of all the hard work into doing that to try and break down tiered and specialized approaches. So we're not approaching everything in the same way that we are kind of showing that there are distinctions and, um, and really trying not to come at everything with a hammer, right? To really have a more customized approach. Um, and so thank you for that. And I know it only makes it more complicated, but, um, but I think it's more appropriate. Um, Lastly, um, I wanted to, or two more things. Um, one is I uh, also wanted to thank you for pointing out um, that complaint driven systems are by their nature inequitable. Um, and having that combination um, on the slide where you talk about, yes, we can look at complaints, but we also need to look at data um, and geographic analysis and try and create a framework for creating a, um, a systemized response um, is, in my opinion, the right way to go. Um, and so I just wanted to point that out and thank you for that. Um, and lastly, I have um, one 
question. I think is Lee still on the call? Or Benna? Yes, I am, Council Member. Oh, okay, thanks. Um, so, um, and I know I didn't give you a heads up that I was going to ask this question, but the January through June is um, uh, that gap um, since we're using the uh, coronavirus relief funding for this portion of it. Um, is the legislative team looking at what um, possible funding sources could um, could fund this work um, after for the January through June? Because in my opinion, I think we have the COVID, the CARES Act funds that we're using now. I suspect there's going to be another sort of COVID related funding opportunity. And then then there's the issue of permanent funding sources, right? Um, and we need a little bit more runway. Um, is the legislative team looking at federal funding opportunities to pay for this work? Absolutely, and I, I think as far as the IGR team is concerned, I think their number one priority is kind of the, the federal assistance um, related to our COVID response and then this specifically. I think, um, you know, negotiations, um, you know, have deteriorated um, within Washington, mm -hmm. within Washington DC, although there's been some movement. Um, so I know the team, uh, along with the mayor's office as well, has been pushing hard on that. But, um, you know, depending on the result in November, we will have a gap. And that's one of the priorities uh, focusing on Washington. For Sacramento, um, you know, they're dealing with larger budget pictures, uh, lar wor worse budget pictures than we are. Um, so much of our work in Sacramento is mostly focused on actual bills and policy work versus kind of fiscal financial recovery. Okay. All right. Uh, in the interest of time, I'll just stop right there. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Council Carrasco. Uh, Hi, uh, thank you so much. Well, I, I won't take up much more of the time because we've been spending at least five hours on this on this topic. But I, I wanted to thank, uh, of course, all of our staff and uh, and wanted to just ask our digital divide folks if we could get that report. Uh, I know it's a verbal report, but if we could please get that in our inboxes so that we can see all of the, our great students who are getting the hot spots and the distribution of, of the tools that they need so that they can continue doing their learning at home. And, uh, and, and Jill, I don't know if you're getting any feedback yet from our school districts as to how it's going and whether our students are getting uh, the support that they need currently or if there's anything that else that we could be doing at this, at this present time. Yeah, thank you, Councilmember. Uh, from the perspective of the technical uh, efficacy of the hotspots, we're getting very good feedback. And um, I, we think that's one reason why there are requests for more of the city hotspots. Um, from the, the perspective, we, we are working with them to ensure that the students are, um, are also learning and, and are successful in all of those other ways that it's important besides just the technical um, working of the hotspot. But uh, we really have been focused on the hotspots now, and our goal is to continue to work with them. I think this has been a great project because we've built really strong relationships with all the school districts directly, as well as the County Office of Education. And so then to keep working with them to help them make sure that the students are able to access resources to see if there's any other supports that we can provide. Uh, and I'm glad that you brought up the uh, additional resources. Uh, Council Member Foley said something that just triggered a little bit of an aha moment for me. Uh, and, and it was not related to necessarily to the digital uh, uh, divide or the digital support that we're providing. But she mentioned how a, a lot of our, even our, 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 our housed uh, residents may be triggered right now or maybe you know dealing with a lot of mental health issues uh, but you know our students are dealing with a lot of mental health issues and uh, and I don't know you know what our role is at this point I think it is just everybody's responsibility to wrap ourselves around everybody because uh, I you know I am in a household with three growing teenagers and uh, the stories that I can tell you and so I know that that uh, that 
our students must be experiencing some high levels of stress and must be experiencing some crisis unlike anything that we've ever experienced. So I'm just putting it out there as something that I think we're gonna have to really consider and have to really start thinking about in terms of how we all begin to think about um, how we stretch ourselves uh, in order to continue helping and supporting our students, including our housed uh, residents who are, are experiencing that mental stress, including uh, yours truly, but, uh, but you know, uh, especially our students. Uh, it, you know, it's, um, it, it's, a, it's a very different uh, time and uh, the digital divide just simply highlighted those gaps that we knew were there. And so we have something concrete that we can actually provide. Now it's the those things that we don't see. It's the it's the uh, abstract, if you will, that uh, we can't put our finger on. That I know is going to start bubbling to the surface. So, uh, but if I could get a, a, a copy of that report, I'd like to be able to see where we're enhancing our indoor and outdoor um, uh, facilities. Uh, I, I would love to be able to provide some sort of uh, guide to our residents, especially you know in, in the areas that that we are enhancing so that we can guide our residents towards those areas for whatever reasons or whatever they may need. But I, I think uh, being able to also provide even uh, some sort of uh, safe distancing kind of events, um, uh, very similar to maybe what supervisor or Superintendent Duan is doing. I'd like to be able to pick her brain and see what she's doing, but be able to get the information out to our residents. Some of them may not even know what's being enhanced around their neighborhood and be able to support our families as well. Some of them may not, may not even have children anymore in their households, but they themselves as adults may need to interact and be able to connect with the rest of the world. But, but I, I just wanted to thank everybody for all of the work that they're doing. I know that everyone is having to shift in ways that they had not imagined that they'd have to do. And, uh, and we're dealing with, um, with having to produce and, and, uh, and provide more so than before with less, um, with, with less um, in every which way. So I wanna thank everybody for, for all of what you're doing under very, very difficult conditions. And I, I also wanna echo what council member Esparza was, uh, was mentioning regarding our houseless population, some of the very dangerous conditions. Of course, I share a district with her, which is on Story and 101, but I also have the ramps on, on McKee and 680, where we tend to have repeated encampments and individuals who tend to uh, sometimes create very unsafe conditions. So I wanna make sure that that, that that doesn't fall off our radar. And, uh, and many times we're calling um, folks to see how we can go ahead and clean that up or how we can uh, make it a safer situation. So so this is, this is happening throughout the city. I recognize that we have a very small team, uh, but, but uh, you know, our residents are getting very frustrated uh, stuff is piling up. Uh, conditions in the neighborhood, especially on the east side, are, are becoming more and more difficult uh, to explain it to, to our residents, especially to the kiddos that are, are living with it. So uh, I'm leaving it for your consideration so that we can see how we can address that and still make it a livable uh, neighborhood for for those who are, are sitting here sometimes very directly in front of in front of these encampments who are that are growing uh, not just in people but in in very unsafe conditions thank you mayor thank you uh, sorry I having problems with the mute button councilman camas did you have your hand up I did, thank you, Mayor, and, and I will uh, also echo the thanks for staff. I did have a couple of questions. Um, so, so staff um, said that they, they offer services and that 100% uh, of the people, they, they got 100% of the people that wanted housing housed. Um, and 
I'm not sure I understood that. Does that mean everybody that you approached got housing? Hi, Council Member Reagan with the Housing Department. So that number was in reference to the over 6,000 calls we've received to our central shelter hotline that we established back in April. And so people who have called that number requesting shelter, we've been able to meet their request. I see. And, and do, you, do you have capacity? Is there things that we could do to offer some of the people who are living in and encampments? Are, is anybody going out there to talk to those folks to offer yes. them? Uh, and, yes. and, and what, you know, you didn't, uh, if you did, I apologize because I didn't hear it. Um, what do they say? How are you, uh, w w are there statistics as to, hey, you know, we offered, you know, uh, our services to uh, the people on under Highway 280 and uh, 87. And, you know, we talked to, 30 people and we housed 10. Is there statistics like that being generated? Yes, we do get those reports back from our contracted outreach providers that say what encampments they visited and then what services were offered and accepted. I don't Is have there... a statistic off the top of my head though about a certain percentage. Yeah, well, you know, I, I would, um, you know, two weeks from now, I think, uh, Oh, no, actually, th you're going to get a break, I think, for another week. So if you could bring it back in three weeks, I'd love to see, you know, because a lot of people say, you know, that the, it doesn't matter. You guys aren't doing your job. You know, you, nobody's offering any services to these people that are unhoused. I, I hear that all the time and nothing ever gets done. But I do want to show that we are doing something and we're approaching some of these people and what those people are saying or I want to know what they're concerned with. What, what, if they're not accepting the services, why are they not accepting? Is that a, a question that they're at being asked as well? Why aren't you accepting the service? Yes, and uh, some of the uh, more common responses we get is um, the shelter may not be able to accommodate specific needs they have or shelter may not be able to accommodate partners or couples or the number of pets they have. Um, and one of the goals in the new community plan under strategy three is to work with our shelter providers countywide to um, look at those shelter conditions and see if there are changes we can make. One of the changes that we did make during COVID-19 was to make shelters available 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So not make people leave in the morning and come back um, in the afternoon. So we'll continue to do those kinds of um, assessments and changes with our shelter providers. Okay, I just, um, and, and I'd love to see in the next report how many people were actually um, offered services and perhaps where too, because obviously there are some very hot, hot spots, you know, in the, in the areas that the 11 areas that we described. And quite frankly, some of the smaller spots are a bigger headache for us because, um, you know, they're living on Caltrans. And as we heard from Jim, you know, it's tough to deal with Caltrans. Uh, I'd love to hear if we're offering, are we offering services to those folks on Caltrans property? We do. They uh, utilize our street outreach team. Okay. So if, if you don't mind, Reagan, I really want to thank you for all your work. This is a, you know, you, you've undertaken a job that is very tough to do. So I, I would appreciate um, if you can come back with those statistics next time, you know, and, uh, and let, let, just let the public know that we are you know, just to let the public know that we are reaching out to those folks and we are doing something, you know. Um, thank you. Uh, my other question is for Jim. Uh, Jim, I appreciate the, uh, the, the discussion on you know, the, the bandwidth of the, the, um, the Department of Transportation and the, and the, the, uh, the you know, the outreach teams and, and, um, and what have you. I, I just, 
uh, I have to say I'm, I'm a little frustrated because I have my list of excuses that I give people all the time as to why we can't clean up Highway 85 and, uh, and 87 off ramps. And I, ha you know, I always blame it on Caltrans. And, um, uh, <laughs> but, you know, but those excuses are getting kind of worked. I, I think, and I'm just frustrated. I know we, we, we're going to introduce a memo tomorrow, so we'll have a bigger discussion on this. But it, frust me, it frustrates me to, to, to have no solutions. Or if the solution that we're going to go for says, it, it, we're kind of giving up. And so, and, and I wanted, you know, I do want to have you hear that. And then, and, and, and quite frankly, if, if, you know, what, what do we tell our, our, you know, if, you, what do we tell our constituents who have complained about uh, garbage and, and quite frankly, Highway 85 was set on fire the other day. Um, so, um, what a couple thoughts on that, Councilor Murray. Let me just say, I, I hear your frustration, and I'm equally as frustrated. I, I don't want to give up on anything. Now, I'm not saying we're giving up on anything. I think I'm saying we're picking our battles because we're trying to be as effective as we can with the limited resources we have. I, I did I did send something back to you yesterday that 85 and Almaden is on Caltrans's list and Olympia did mention that. So it's not like Caltrans is doing nothing, but are they meeting the level of demand? No, but 85 and Almaden is third on their list of priorities and they are going to get to that. You and I also talked about a couple of other things that, that we can continue to talk about offline. What I, what I need our team to do though is to, is to look at all these big rocks that need to be moved and what it's gonna to take to get effective results and what do we have the capacity to really move? So I, I will look at it. I will certainly have a conversation with the district board director about it and just get his size, you know, a conversation about that, that's something certainly I can do and I'm, I'm willing to do, but to get an MOA where they're going to pay us to do all the work for them that, that I, I sense is a major work effort. Probably would go to policy priority setting, right? It's certainly more than 40 hours of work. I think it would probably displace something on our current work plan, um, but we need to put it in the overall uh, set of work plan items and see where it ranks related to what we have to get done by December. Um, so, you know, I, I'm not saying that that we won't evaluate that among other things. But I can tell you if the council directs that to happen and takes nothing else off, what we're trying to get done by December, we will not make as much progress as, my, as, as we're intending to do. That, I'm just giving you my, my very upfront straight assessment on that one. And I've always appreciated you and your upfront assessment. I mean, I, I like truth, uh, truth to be told. Um, I'd love to know what other things that we can put on the back burner and see if we can work on this. I'd, I'd love to hear what your thoughts are on that. Um, and quite frankly, uh, you know, the, the fact that I'm weighing in heavily on this it should be a compliment to you because I trust you a lot more than I trust Caltrans. And so uh, my, my, my thinking is that we can do the job faster and better than Caltrans. And that's, that's the point that, that I think we're trying to make. I just hate having our hands tied behind yeah. our back. I, I do too. Time. I do too. That, I haven't met things that I don't like to solve. So I, I, I hear you, council member. That's a fair point. Thank you. And thanks uh, to the rest of the staff. Um, I'm sorry, I don't have uh, questions for everyone. And uh, thank you all for your efforts. Thank you. I appreciate um Councilmember uh, Camus's recognition for uh, Reagan Hanger's great work and the difficulty of that job. Um, I, I just wanted to ask one other clarification on that question that Councilmember Camus raised, Reagan, about it, there, there are restrictions that are imposed, I think, through the funding stream that have to do with health conditions. Is, is that right? Yes, yeah, so uh, we certainly don't have enough 
hotels available to be sheltering um, everyone who wrote who requests a hotel and so uh, hotels right now are currently being used to shelter our most vulnerable so as defined by the CDC so those are older adults with the underlying health conditions that the CDC has outlined things like severe asthma diabetes COPD right okay so we, we we're using the money we got for the purpose it's been it can be used for and, and you know we're, we're pretty well maxed out um and we certainly hope there'll be more um Jill I was hoping to ask you a bit about the on the digital inclusion front um, and thank you, Reagan, for all that. Um, on, on digital inclusion, Jill, you know, for the 8,281 kids and their families who have hotspots, are we confident there are 8,281 devices in those children's hands that they can then use with those hotspots? Are, are we confident the hotspot has fully solved the problem? Or do we think some number of those kids have con connectivity without a device? Uh, thank you for the question, Mayor. Actually, um, no. I think that we've always been aware that as a city, we were focusing on um, providing connectivity as kind of a baseline to allow ch children as well as their families to connect. Um, but that the schools, especially through some of the funding that we've distributed through the Digital Inclusion Fund and other resources that they've acquired through the county, would be able to fund devices and yet we know that there's still a significant gap so one of our goals had been to um, issue the hotspots and then turn our attention towards trying to potentially pair a a computing device with the hotspot to ensure that they're um, that they are functioning uh, we have a weekly meeting with the county office of ed and keep uh, track of the delta that's still outstanding um, but the, to be honest, their purchasing hasn't yet caught up with all the funds that have been distributed, although they are tracking that and we're, we're staying um, in alignment with them to, to make sure that we understand the outstanding need for computers. Are, are we confident at least that the county money is being spent on computers for children who are getting uh, hotspots? Or um, I think we're worried about is that we're buying... The county's buying 8,000 computers. We put out 8,000 hotspots. And, and now we got 16,000 kids who still can't learn because <laughs> they don't have both, right? Do, do we know right. the information? <laughs> we, are, we, are, we are trusting in the school districts to make those decisions because uh, school districts are employing a, a large number of solutions that they're getting from, other, from different uh, sources. So um, we are confident that, and I just heard this morning that the county office was, um, is planning to purchase, I think, believe it's nearly 11,000 computing devices for San Jose students with the county funding. So it'll be a larger than, you know, 6,000, but, uh, and then there's the funds that we've already distributed. But to your direct question, the the decision to match a specific hotspot and a specific device to meet the needs of a specific family is being done at the school district level okay and we feel pretty confident that they are really doing that we do we've uh as i said we i feel that we've really developed good relationships with the districts through this process we have ongoing communications i mean i think it's a huge problem to solve so i won't say that it's perfect yet but we're committed to continuing to work with them um, as we find, as we all find out about issues in a specific neighborhood or a specific household and work together to try to solve it. And thank you for that. And, and as we're, we're now launching the Wi-Fi, I think we, we, can we say it's successfully launched in Overfelt at this point or? Yes. Okay, great. That's wonderful news. So that's several thousand families there and hopefully in a little while over at Yerba Buena as well. Um, can we then start to reallocate hotspots from those households to other households who might be in need since those households are being served through the free Wi-Fi program? That is a good uh, observation. I think that uh, one, one um, piece of information that might help is that Eastside Union High School did not request any hotspots. 
And so we would be talking about working with the feeder schools to identify whether or not the families can be adequately served by the Wi-Fi network now that it's up and going at Overfill. So we will have that conversation with them. And I think one of the things that's come up is that there was testing being done to ensure that the network was uh, working in the, uh, for the community, but that we need to be starting to, to really build awareness about how to utilize the network. Uh, we're building a landing page that can connect people who get on the public side of the network to other resources. Um, that they can now access online. So, so all of that work is also being done. Okay. It's a good reminder. Thank you for okay. uh, mentioning that. If our office can help in terms of ensuring we had the most efficient allocation, let, be happy to. Um, on, on the question about uh, cleanups, Jim, I, I know, this is, I guess you, you knew this would be a big topic. Um, so thank you for all the work that Olympia, everybody is doing um, out there uh, because we know it's a huge, huge challenge. I wanted to ask about the use of, um, do we still call it the bridge program, which is primarily the, the women and men who work through Goodwill and downtown street team who are, who are cleaning? Yes. Uh, yes. yes. Great. Um, and, and I understand you're using that program as sort of your tier one to address um, encampment, you're not. It, it, it's it's a maybe a an offshoot of tier one, Mayor. It, oh, it is it is. I think it's about seventy locations. They're city. Um, I'm going to call them DOT properties. Trash cleanup. Okay, understood. And I understood, and I appreciate all the work that Sarah and, and her team did around uh, uh, aligning the dots, <laughs> so that we could be really focused on some of the challenges we know with too many of our residents living outside. But I wanted to ask about what I consider, and this is just my own bias, the highest priority locations, which are those locations which are most visible to our residents, the ones that, re that our residents drive by every day, or maybe they're on the 22 bus and they see that side of Roosevelt every day or they, I mean, it's what they encounter routinely in their commute um, or, because it's in a highly visible location. It's at Oakland and, and 101, right? We all know, right? Um, or, or 10th and 280. And I'm just wondering, are we doing prioritization, particularly with that, with that tier one cleaning, with the, with the bridge teams? Um, are we focusing that in those highly visible locations? Because I, I guess health, but it seems to me it's about how people feel about their own community and how they feel about their own city. And, and, it, it's just in those highly visible locations that um, that that I'm guessing rubs everybody the worst. And can we say that we're identifying sites by virtue of that issue of visibility? I would say this. I, I don't know that that was a specific piece of of some of the very significant evaluation we just did, but I know that Olympia and her teams, from their hot spots and their priority, I would imagine that's part of it. You know, her and I talked about 13th and 101 Oakland, and I know that's on a regular pickup cycle. So I think that would qualify for that, but I'll let Olympia and Sarah, you know, briefly add any response to it, Mayor. Um, it's not something I'm personally involved in, but let's hear what they, how they factor that in. Uh, thank you, Mayor. So uh, two responses from a data perspective. If complaints came through Beautify San Jose or the Homeless Concerns Line or San Jose 311, if those are sites that people feel strongly enough to access their local government to complain about, they made it into our analysis. Secondly, I would say that the, the purpose of the visual site assessments was to do exactly what you're talking about, was to understand through 195 miles of city streets, what is out there that people can see and where are people living. So the entire tiered process, not just tier one, tier ones through tier three, cover everything that people can see from a road or a trail. And with that, maybe Olympia, you'd like to add something. 
No, I just think for the tier three specifically, because those tend to have the sites that have the most debris at them, that the team does as they, they adjust their route day by day to make sure they address those areas that we know people drive by on a regular basis on because we know it's very visible in a very visible location with thousands of people driving by it each day. So we do make adjustments as we go out to clean up based on that visibility, knowing that, you know, on the volunteer side, we got to have people taking pride in their neighborhood. So they want to help us kind of do the work to keep our city beautiful. So we do take that into account. Okay. I appreciate that. I guess, Sarah, I just want to offer one, I'm sure you've considered this already, but one limitation in terms of reporting. I know there are many limitations in relying on reports and complaints, but one of them is, you know, certainly in my own experience, the stuff we see that's most frequently seen if you're a driver, either getting on or off or expressway or on or off of a freeway or uh, at a major intersection, that's, that's the least likely you are to actually reach for the smartphone to use the 311 app, especially now that I think it still requires you to log in every single time uh, you need to use it. And I'm hoping we're going to fix that really soon. Um, so it, it's just not safe to use the reporting tool at that time. And so I'm really concerned. I keep thinking, you know, I'd really love to report that if it weren't for the fact that I'm moving, I have to accelerate now to 65 miles an hour. Um, <laughs> and, and so I'm just wondering, are, are we considering that as Yes, I would agree. Um, and that was the purpose of the, the PTCOs going out to visually assess the sites and stop wherever along the route they saw an encampment. So someone living in a structure, someone living in a vehicle, someone living um, in an RV, whenever they observe that along the route, uh, regardless of whether or not there was some complaint uh, filed in our system, they would stop and submit an observation survey. Sir, I'm, I'm sorry. I guess I should have been more specific with my question. I had the same concern that Mark, a member of the community, did when, during our public comment, which is that there's a lot of places where we're just seeing a lot of trash that really doesn't necessarily relate to somebody living outside. It's, it's the fact that there's just a lot of trash there and nobody's bothered to clean it up. And as I think about what we're trying to do and hopefully expanding the Goodwill and Downtown Streets team efforts and so forth, you know, that would be an area where you know, you don't need heavy equipment. Folks with some physical limitation can still do the work. And, and that's where, again, the highest impact is where people see it frequently, even when there's no encampment. And, and so I'm guess independent of that encampment issue, you know, are we really able to prioritize those highly visible locations? So, so Mayor, what, what I mentioned earlier um, was that the illegal dumping, the rapid response, proactive, reactive, that's something we did not do as deep a dive on during the July, August period. We really focused on the encampment yeah. challenges that we were having, and that will get the deep dive in this fall period. So I think we're going to take your input in. Okay. We believe that visibility of trash and debris is a priority. We have goals around visibility, equity, um, efficiency. So all of those will be factored in. I, I think we're just going to take your input and that's an important input into our assessment of the illegal dumping program. So it will get that type of review as we do the same assessment and deeper dive on the illegal dumping program. We have not gotten as deep on that one as we did on the encampment side of things. Great. Th thank you. And forgive me for beating that, that, that horse. Um, I, I, the, um, the question around uh, the 311 app I know keeps coming up because I hear a few people have just gotten frustrated and they stopped using it now because of the constant need to log in all the time. When do we expect a fix to that? Let me, this is Kip, uh, let me, let me get back with you on, um, on a detailed roadmap on that. We're very aware of that. There's some security issues that are, that are related to that. And so the balance here is that the Previous way we did it was very effective and not as secure. Um, and given the security climate we're in, we, we've got a security piece that's now created a user issue. So we're aware of all of that. We've got the fix in the product roadmap. Let me let me bring the app back a deeper dive with that. Um, but uh, I'm highly aware that when you have to when you create the friction of having to log in and remember a password, which I can never do myself, uh, then the utility <laughs> of the app goes uh, from hero to zero pretty quickly. Yeah. Um, and that, that friction and utility of the app is everything here. 
because uh, what we'll be left with is a couple of really, really, really dedicated users um, who, who, who I, I appreciate them, but they also do not represent the broader group of the community that we want and need using the app. So hear that loud and clear and understand that. And I'll, I'll actually, uh, if, if it's okay, consider prioritizing that for a bit deeper dive, um, either in smart cities or here or, or both. Great, thank you very much, appreciate it. Um, and then finally, I know that um, we had a challenge when, when we first took on this, this issue of the freeway, um, the, the challenge with the lack of cleanliness on our freeways, it was probably back in 2015. I remember Senator Bell got involved and we were, we were working on agreements with Caltrans and um, we even went, they, they had huge challenges just filling spots on their maintenance teams. And so we hustled and found the California or the San Jose Conservation Corps. Um, and we, we did an enormous amount of work uh, and the city manager's team, Paul Pereira, lots of folks. And, and then we got to this point where we couldn't sign an MOA or MOU with Caltrans because there was some indentification clause or something. That was, was the obstacle. Correct. And so the county had Correct. to sign it which meant now the county's sort of allocating staff and all that. And it that means we may or may not get prioritized. We just don't know. And I guess now more recently, we've got the probation pretty much stopping the cleanups because of all the issues over at the jails. So now we're, and so I guess the question is, is, is there an opportunity for us to at least restart the conversation about, could we get over this road bump about whatever that indemnification clause issue was that the county seemed to solve that we didn't? Um, so that we could just sign a contract and help provide a work opportunity, work program for a lot of unemployed residents and you know, get things clean. So, so Mayor, I, I'm not as familiar as that one, obviously, as you are, or maybe Olympia is. Uh, let us look at that one and see where it's at. Probably it's a discussion with the attorneys. I don't know if they advised us not to change the indemnification or what have you, but uh, I, I would need to look into that. I, I wasn't direct, you know, directly involved with it. I don't know, Dave or Olympia, if you, if you all know anything about that one or, or Angel. We I would definitely need to go back to our attorney. We need to okay. go to the city attorney's office and discuss it in more detail. Okay, we'll take it offline. Thanks, okay. Olympia. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Back to the council, uh, council member Esparza. Mayor, uh, I, I'll keep it short, but um, you must have been trying to keep it short too, because I wanted to connect a couple of dots for people that may not know. Um, uh, the, some of the questions that you asked in terms of devices and what's available, most people may not be aware that because of uh, President Trump's tariff situation, we have a, a number of devices that are stuck either overseas or in ports. And so um, every hotspot is really precious right now. And so I just wanted to kind of provide some background on that. Um, and then ask Jill um, if, uh, do you have a breakdown of the device and hotspot distribution? I know Franklin McKinley was lucky enough to get 500 hotspots, which were distributed at the beginning of school. Um, we do, you have that? yes, we do. And I can provide that to you. Um, I think per uh, Council Member Carrasco's request earlier, we'll put together a brief with the information from the, the PowerPoint and we can provide information about the schools in your district. Okay, great, thank you. Um, and then uh, lastly, just another plug for equity for the SJ Beautify work. And thanks again to all for um, all the work that's gone into this. Obviously there's a lot of passion about it because it's four o'clock. That's all, thank you. Thank you. Um, Council member Carrasco. Uh, just out of curiosity, why, Jill, do you know why Eastside Union High School District did not request hotspots? I mean, I know that they're, that we're, you know, we're building out our infrastructure and uh, Eastside, of course, was very instrumental in doing their part in it. But why on, on heaven's earth would, would they not <clears throat> request any hotspots? Yeah, and I, I, 
I should have clarified in the first round, they did not um, request hotspots. And I think that, um, but, but since then in this new round that I was mentioning that we're trying to solve for now, they have made a request. And I think it's a couple of things that we're learning from school districts. One is that they had another solution in mind that turned out that there were some challenges with it. Perhaps they had devices on order that they haven't been able to receive yet. Um, and then the second piece is that because they have, they do have the Wi-Fi network, they, um, okay, I just got a message from my staff that that was the case, that they, um, they had some items on order that they thought, or that they had acquired, they thought would meet the need. And then once the first two weeks of school happened, they started to hear from families where they had a greater need. So they have requested in the second round. And, and okay, okay, good to know because that really yeah. was a huge concern uh, because I, I, I just know that there's a lot, of, uh, a lot of our teens out there that are not connected or there's uh, several teens. Like I said, in my case, I have three and they're in full, you know, they're on, on full classroom overload. And then, uh, and then they, they all three get on uh, a full day and that's from eight to four, in some cases until 4.30. And I've got a screaming teenager at the back of the house when their his Zoom drops and it'll drop three to four times a day uh, when when they get on and we're we're you know we're kind of at our, our at our wits end so if it is listening i don't know what to do anymore to extend or to bounce off walls uh you know our our um so i know that if i'm struggling i know other families are really struggling to figure out what to do so i'm glad to hear that that they they requested it and do you know just off the top of your head how many hotspots they've requested off the top of my head, I think it was yeah. 551. That's it? This is, can I just, um, but, I'd like to repeat this yeah. statistic. I want to repeat but, the statistic. Eastside Union High School District cuts, Eastside Union High School District cuts San Jose right in half in terms of, of uh, high school districts. And it is the largest high school district in Northern California. I'm going to repeat that. It is the largest high school district in Northern California. So that just really concerns me that they've only requested 500. Oh, it's 661. Thankfully, I have um, uh, folks giving, but, but I think that the, that doesn't, I think the reason council member is that they, we're not the only solution that they're using. Okay, I think okay. that's the biggest raising. And because they have had they have had their Wi-Fi um, attendance area for one attendance area for James Lake for you know over a year, and yeah. now they're going to have overfelt. So I think that you know we'll continue to work with them, but yeah. they are reporting to us where they are finding that they have out outstanding yeah. need that they haven't been able to meet through other means yeah yeah I'm, I'm so concerned because this is their last four years uh you know the seniors this is it for them you've got incoming freshmen we are uh you know i don't anticipate that we're gonna go back to school uh even in spring i just don't see it i don't see it i don't even see a hybrid model going back and so our kids uh so, so I, I, you know, I'm going to challenge everybody to the following. We used to call it a, an educational opportunity or opportunity gap. And so what we've seen is that in the beginning of COVID, every kiddo had a, a slump in their learning. They all just took a nosedive. Mm -hmm. But within a couple of weeks, within a couple of weeks, those from wealthier, you know, well-resourced neighborhoods, those kiddos went right back up. And I, I call it the roller coaster of academy, you know, academics, I should say, roller coaster of academics. They went right back up. Our kiddos who were already struggling are continuing to take that nosedive. They haven't come back up. So if we called it before, an academic or opportunity gap. What do we call it now? 
because it, it's not an opportunity gap anymore. What is it called now as we're in the pandemic, as we're in quarantine? Because it has to have a new name now. You know, aside from calling it a, tra a total tragedy, because these kids are not going to catch up. And so, so this is the challenge is what do we do for those kids who I just really believe that they're struggling, that, you know, we've seen the absenteeism uh, uh, just, just go through the roof. A lot of kids are falling through the cracks. They're absent. Uh, we don't even know where they are anymore. So before we used to see them out on the street, they used to kind of, you know, we could pick them up, we could identify them. We don't know where they are. They're just not reporting anymore. And so I'm so concerned that 500, 600 hotspots have been, re, uh, have been allocated or they've been requested. And I know that James Lick has, you know, has a build out and everything, but it's James Lick, it's Independence High School, it's Overfelt, but it's not just that, it's Silver Creek, it's, uh, it's Yerba Buena, it is, uh, it, you know, uh, my mind is drawing a blank right now, but it's 13, I believe 13 <laughs> high schools, plus the charter high schools that are also part of Eastside Union High School District. It's the largest high school district in Northern California. This needs to sink in for each and every single one of us. The largest high school district in Northern California. So I'm gonna leave it at that. I was gonna be brief, but I'm just, I'm just really shocked. Uh, I, 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 I guess, you know, this is going to be, this is going to be tragic. It's going to be tragic in terms of what is going to happen to these kids because they're going to fall so far behind if we don't connect them. And at least, and you know, and we we're investing millions of dollars. We've got to, we've got to make sure that, uh, that we do everything possible. And, and I know that uh, Superintendent Funk is fantastic. And it's such a loss to the city of San Jose that he's leaving us. It really is. It's such a loss. And I wish we could convince him to stay but uh, but I, I think that he he thought that he was going to get these hotspots and unfortunately it just didn't happen. And so now I think we need to call him up and say, what do you need? Because uh, I, I think you may have underestimated your numbers and maybe be proactive about that. So anyway, so thank you so much. I think uh, Connie Kip wanted to jump in on this. Okay, just yeah. very, very quickly, we, we will be proactive and we also will be aggressive in this next round of hotspots trying to meet the felt need and express need of, of all of the schools that, that are out there. So we'll, we'll double back and do a check-in, both through Marianne Dewan, who's been a fantastic partner and, and, and directly with Eastside, um, and, and, and see about those numbers. But uh, and we will be aggressively trying to fill them. The one thing I would offer, you've asked this question a couple of times, and this is a little bit off to the side, but since you've directly asked it, you, know, the, you, you asked, what do you call this or how do you describe this? And I think, you know, I, I, in a previous life, I was an education consultant for the World Bank uh, at one point. And, Within the context of West Africa, there are there periods of times where the disruption to the education system was so intense that you would essentially lose a school year. And in, in the French West Africa, they would call it an année blanche, a blank year, a white year. And it referred to the fact that you'd have a year with no marks, no grades, but also that sense of a, of a completely white year with, with nothing to show for it. And I think, uh, I don't know what the English version is of that, but I think that we're at risk of that for, for many of our students to have an année blanche, a white year. Uh, and I think that's that's the specter that you're raising, and we take that very seriously. And again, uh, there's a limited amount that we can do, but I, I think Jill and her team are, are are trying to move heaven and earth to make sure that the, the connectivity and where possible the devices are in the hands of the kids, so that they have the opportunity to avoid that. So we we take that very seriously, and we'll uh, we'll we'll double back to make sure we're aggressively going after the right number of, of hotspots. Thank you, Councilman. Thank you, and and I appreciate that. Thank you so much for for adding that, Kip. Uh, uh, and I'm going to practice my pronunciation of that because I think that's helpful. And I think that that would be okay because it's a pandemic, right? We, how often does a pandemic come around? It's a pandemic. So, so unusual times call for unusual consequences, unusual results, unusual predicaments. It would be okay if we all had a blank uh, year 
if it was across the board, right? If it, if my East Side kiddos, or I call them pollitos, my little chickadees, right? My little pollitos were not in comparison to my little pollitos on the West Side or my little pollitos in Cupertino. If it was a, a, a blank slate or a blank year across the board and everybody said, hey, we're not gonna take markings from anybody, right? And that's why I've said, we've got to advocate with the uh, superintendent of education at the state level and say, uh-uh, this has to be fair across the board and there is no competition anywhere. And you've got to accept that this year is a wash and you're not going to unfairly judge my Isai pollitos with the pollitos on, in, from Cupertino or Los Gatos because it's not fair. And so if we could do that, I would be okay with that, knowing that somewhere we're going to be able to help them catch up and, uh, and not use this against them. Because now we really see the unfairness of everything. It is just glaring. And, uh, and it is, uh, if a pandemic doesn't help us to truly understand the inequities, you know, uh, I don't know what does. But but th that's why we need to be able to really um, uh, advocate for those, uh, for, for uh, maybe for that, uh, that wash, I don't know. Uh, but in the meantime, we still need to be able to provide those tools so that they don't fall in, in their own personal growth uh, further and further behind. But in terms of the standards and how the, the, they deal with the rest of society, we need to be able to advocate for, for equal treatment without uh, being penalized for, it, for conditions that, they, that were completely out of their control, like a world pandemic, right? So thank, but thank you so much for that. I will call you to help me with my pronunciation. Uh, but thank you. And, and thank you so much for helping me uh, to be proactive on this, because I'm very concerned about uh, the number of hotspots that, that were requested. I think we're gonna need more than that. Okay. Uh, thanks uh, to all the EOC team uh, for all the information and all, more importantly, all the hard work. Let's move on now uh, to item 3.3, which is our food distribution update. We have a presentation, Dave. That's correct, Mayor. All right. Good, good, good afternoon, uh, Mayor, uh, council members. We'll, we'll, we'll jump right in here. Um, uh, Angel Rios, Deputy City Manager. Uh, and Emergency Operation Center Ops Lead. And today uh, the team and many of our food network partners are here to provide a, a, an update on food distribution. Uh, this is a cross-reference from the Smart Cities and Service Improvement Committee um, presentation that we did. Uh, you, you know, March 16th, uh, for, for those of us that have been working this food issue and, and really the OC in general, uh, I think will forever be etched in our minds uh, for two reasons. One. Um, because that was the day that, uh, you know, we, we accepted the request from the county to take over as food lead countywide. Um, but probably more importantly, it was the day that kind of kicked off um, a, a pattern that we saw because in, in literally a matter of weeks, we saw food, ins food insecurity almost double through this whole COVID uh, response. And so, um, the good news here is that we avoided a major food crisis. Uh, and we did that by collaborating with many of our food network partners uh, to scale our response and by applying innovative principles as we built a, a new business literally within a, a five week period. Um, today, uh, you're gonna hear a presentation. Uh, you're gonna hear a, a status update on our, our collective response to countywide food insecurity. You'll hear a little bit about uh, some of the innovative approaches that we've taken around food distribution, a quick status update on grants and contracts, a few success stories. Um, you'll hear uh, uh, an update on interagency agreements, transitions and next steps. And, and probably more importantly, you'll hear directly from some of our food uh, network partners um, as they have played a significant role uh, in really addressing this food need uh, countywide. Um, we, we may have lost a few uh, of our presenters, but uh, the, the ones that were scheduled to speak, we have from Second Harvest Food Bank, uh, Leslie Bacho and Tracy Weatherby. Uh, Dr. Dewan from the county uh, was going to be here. She had to leave. Uh, however, Shami uh, uh, Karim 
uh, is with us and uh, she's been a, uh, an amazing uh, partner, especially on the front lines. Uh, you'll hear from Michelle Liu, uh, CEO of the Health Trust, uh, Executive Director of Vegilution, Casey Hill, and Annelisa Del Pinal, uh, CEO of SourceWise, and Nate Mook, uh, CEO of World Central Kitchen. Um, so with that, let me turn it over to our, our two food co-leads, uh, Dolan Beckel and Neil Rafino, and they're also joined by uh, Jill Mariani, um, and they'll walk you through uh, our food presentation. Great, thank you, Angel. Uh, good afternoon, Honorable Mayor, committee members, members of the public and city staff. Dolan Beckel here, Director of the Office of Civic Innovation, and currently the EOC co-lead with Neil Rafino for the Food and Necessities Distribution Branch. Uh, a picture, or in this case a graph, says a thousand words, and while many of you have seen this slide before, it highlights many of the important aspects of the countywide food distribution program we want to reinforce in today's report. These three horizontal lines highlight three important milestones. The bottom line represents food insecurity pre-COVID at approximately 1.8 million meals per week. The middle dotted line is the rolling average of food insecurity during COVID, currently at 2.6 million meals a week. And the top line highlights the food insecurity index from Professor Starbird at Santa Clarita University and his estimate of maximum food insecurity at over 3 million meals per week as a result of the pandemic and ongoing economic impact. Uh, the stacked bar charts show our seven major food distribution channels countywide and the critical importance of our nonprofit food bank partner, Second Harvest, shown in blue, our school program shown in purple, and the Revolution Food Support to Reserve Capacity, as well as Serve All Ages School Meals, shown in yellow. This graph tells us that we were able to scale programs and reserve capacity to meet the demand and avoid a widespread food crisis so far. Uh, this graph also tells us that food insecurity changes quickly and speed can be equally as important in cost as we deploy social services. While we are not out of the woods and the elimination of the $600 unemployment stimulus, we fear food insecurity will rise again and we must all be vigilant and prepared to act quickly if necessary. Fortunately, we'll be reporting shortly that the branch has now hit our stride in issuing grants and contracts and preparing for continuing competitively procured services throughout the end of the year uh, in the city. I would point out on this graph that the week of August 21st and that August 28th, uh, the far right have incomplete data from some of the school sites. So they did not accurately show the degree of food insecurity. And we would estimate that is actually much higher than we're showing for those last two weeks. Um, next slide. So when the city agreed to the county request to coordinate countywide food distribution and also provide some food service delivery, food insecurity was one of the bigger concerns for city and county leadership because of the impact on life and livelihood and the large number of unknowns. The early models indicated that the county might see quickly 20,000 COVID-19 positive residents needing to isolate during a shelter in place order with no access to meals or groceries and no clear touchless to the door delivery channel. City leadership gave Neil and I the directive to one, move fast, two, feed our vulnerable and at-risk residents, three, think out of the box, and four, worry about the bureaucracy on the back end. So we did in fact build a new business or at least a new city department in less than five weeks with some key areas of focus, including countywide governance, maximizing the existing food network, applying innovation principles, standing up a talented team, and reserving capacity to um, manage risk. Next slide. So when we took on the distribution uh, and coordination on March 16th, we immediately pivoted all of the Office of Civic Innovation to support the nascent EOC food branch being staffed from the Parks, Recreation and Neighborhood Services or PRNS department. Later, some of the innovation staff was also peeled off to support the digital inclusion and distance learning with Jill and Kip. Of the 25 people who have been staffed to the office over the last several years, only one person actually remains dedicated to civic innovation today, and she is working with the Information Technology Department on the San Jose Language Translation Implementation. So this mashup of PRNS and civic innovation for food distribution proved to be very successful. Um, 
next slide, uh, slide five, thank you. So, um, excuse me, on slide five, sorry. Uh, we applied a number of innovation methods and principles as we scaled the, the food distribution branch. Uh, in the interest of time, the staff memo has various examples of these methods and details. And so I'm just going to touch on a few uh, in the interest of hearing from our food network partners. I'm happy to answer questions from the council later about how we apply these innovation methods and tools to food distribution. Next slide. So we applied John Doerr's objectives and key results concepts being used increasingly throughout the city. And these three objectives we defined for the food branch have held up pretty well. Uh, feed our most vulnerable, maximize the existing food network partners, and scale for a potential widespread food crisis. Next slide. We applied a basic yet holistic model of plan, deliver, operate, and manage to build a high-performing internal team within five weeks while continuously improving our relationship with the community-based organizations and other stakeholders. When we first started in March, we were really focused on operate, but we really needed to create an organization like any startup we'd see in Silicon Valley that had to simultaneously plan, deliver, operate, and manage with key leaders like Neil Rufino, Andreas Flora Shelton and myself having to wear many hats at the same time. We also created policy and nonprofit advisory teams with Second Harvest, Silicon Valley Council of Nonprofits, County Social Services, the Office of Education, and other key organizations to help guide our work. Um, now I'd like to introduce my partner in crime, Neil Rufino, who's going to lead us through uh, some of our funding and contracts and the success stories we've seen with food distribution countywide. So Neil, take it away. Thanks, Stolen. Uh, good afternoon, Mayor, members of the Council and the public. Uh, I am Neil Rufino with the Parks, Recreation, and Neighborhood Services Department, and as Dolan mentioned, the co-lead of the Food Distribution Branch in the EOC. Uh, as stated earlier in the presentation, the Food Necessities Branch works under three main objectives, feeding our most vulnerable, maximizing the existing food network, and being ready to scale for widespread crisis. Overall, we have funded a network, network of agencies uh, in which 89% of the funding has gone to nonprofits. This work could not have been done without the existing nonprofit food infrastructure that we have, learned, uh, with, that we have leaned upon. Uh, as you can see from the slide, the diversity of our initial partnerships helped meet the initial food need across the county, and I am glad to have a few of our partners here today to present. As the initial search to get food and groceries out, and working through the appropriate due diligence toward maximizing the city's ability for federal reimbursement, our current action steps are the release of a series of competitive uh, solicitations, including a $5 million for meals and grocery delivery, which uh, recently closed and the uh, applications are currently being evaluated, $3 million for unhoused food delivery. Uh, the deadline for that RFP is uh, due next week, Tuesday. And we will soon be releasing a grant solicitation to support a collective impact effort and for additional grants uh, to nonprofits to meet other unmet needs. Uh, these RFPs uh, will allow the city to evaluate the true cost of providing these services across different types of organizations, business models, and economies of scale. Again, these solicitation packages are for services through December 30th, the end of our current Corona uh, relief funds. Alongside uh, the RFP, a series of grants have been targeted, uh, including a $4 million grant that contracts the San Jose Conservation Corps to support the Second Harvest uh, grocery preparation and delivery services, funds uh, to Bateman Food Services, who provides the food to our current senior meals program to meet their increased numbers of seniors. And next slide, Eric. And in partnership with First Five Santa Clara County, uh, the team has coordinated necessities, including diapers, wipes, and formula to over 5,000 families in the, count, in the community. Through monthly distributions, uh, families have been uh, ensured that the children's needs are met. First Five has distributed uh, 12,415 diaper kits, um, over 9,000 cans of certified infant formula, and 62% of all these families uh, that were served reside in the city of San Jose. Next slide, Eric. In terms of volunteer support, the team has also coordinated and supplied over 5,000 community volunteers, redeployed over 50 city staff to support uh, 
or to support of the organizations listed on the slide here. And as mentioned earlier, funded 100, up to 120 San Jose Conservation Corps members to directly support Second Harvest. Next slide. Uh, as we get into the presentations by our partners, wanted to put a few uh, pictures up in terms of the work that was done uh, across the community. Uh, the top left is a picture at Franklin McKinley uh, School District at Santee Elementary School. Uh, this uh, service in partnership with the school district, uh, we had our Park and Rec Youth Intervention staff uh, provide the staffing and the meals uh, for all ages and adults uh, uh, on Friday. So the meals could be provided for those families on the weekend. On the top right is a picture at the Mexican Heritage uh, Plaza, La Plaza in partnership with the Second Harvest Food Bank of Silicon Valley, um, where has transformed into convenient and safe location for Eastside families to access food supplies and information. The bottom left uh, picture is uh, the pilot program of Great Plates Delivered, which we'll hear, hear uh, about a bit later in this presentation. Uh, the bottom center picture is uh, the distribution of the uh, infant and baby diapers uh, by first five. And the bottom right is the Born Blessed event. I would like to thank uh, Council Member Foley and her team for bringing this opportunity forward uh, to us. This uh, event by uh, San Francisco 49ers wide receiver Kendrick Bourne and his Born Blessed Foundation uh, took place at Emma Cruz Park on June 20th. Uh, they helped uh, provide over 100,000 pounds of fresh fruit and vegetables at the park and uh, served nearly uh, 1,200 cars. Um, next slide. And with that, uh, we are pleased to be joined by a number of our partners to have them share their incredible work in the community and share their perspectives on food security over the COVID-19 response and into the long term. So I'd like uh, next to move and introduce Leji Bacho and Tracy Weatherby of Second Harvest of Silicon Valley. Thank you, Neil. I'm Leslie Bacho, a CEO at Second Harvest. And I just wanna thank you for the opportunity to, to share how we've responded to the dramatic increase in food insecurity during the pandemic. As um, Angel mentioned, we have seen the need doubled and we are now serving 500,000 people every single month. All of the work we do, we do through partnerships and we are grateful to the city of San Jose for your partnership. We are grateful to the hundreds of nonprofits that we partner with who do this work side by side with us day in and day out. Um, Second Harvest was founded in 1974 and it is really because of this incredible network of partnerships that we have formed over decades that we were able to respond so quickly and in such a significant way. You can go to the next slide. I thought that I would start by just telling you a little bit about um, who we are in our network. So we are part of Feeding America, a national network of 200 food banks. We have a very strong uh, state association of food banks here in California. And then we are the food bank um, assigned to serve Santa Clara and San Mateo counties. And through these partnerships, we do a lot of um, advocacy at both the state and national level. Next slide. How we work locally is that we have over 300 nonprofit partners. So if you are a nonprofit organization and you serve a low income population, you can apply to be a member of the food bank and all of the food we provide free to those partners. And then of course, free to our clients. And that is a bit different than most food banks charge a fee to their partners, not to clients, but to their partners. But all of our food, even all the food that we purchase, we provide for free. So most organizations that you might run into in both of our counties, if they're providing food, the majority of it is likely coming from Second Harvest. And that goes out in two ways. The majority of it goes out through grocery distributions. And that's both through agency partners like social service agencies, uh, faith-based organizations, other sorts of food pantries, or through distribution partnerships that we have with schools. We partner with over 130 K through 12 schools. We have pantries, grocery distributions at all of our local community colleges, at San Jose State University. We have it at housing sites. During the pandemic, we were looking for any partners that have parking lots and are able to help us kind of stand up one of these drive-through distributions. 
A good example of a partnership Kip mentioned earlier in the meeting, um, Catholic Charities, and they are one of our strongest partners. And so all of those groceries they are distributing, the majority of that food is um, from Second Harvest. Of course, we also provide food to nonprofits who provide meals. So that might look like um, homeless shelters, it looks like uh, meal programs, it looks like senior centers, it looks like after school snack programs. Next slide. I won't spend a lot of time on this, but we also do a lot of advocacy for child nutrition programs, a lot of advocacy for CalFresh, a lot of working with our school partners to help expand school meals, universal school meals, and also summer meals. But then another really important piece that was critical during the pandemic is we have a food connection hotline. We have a team of 18 multilingual um, speakers who answer our food connection hotline and connect people with groceries or help screen people for CalFresh and kind of start that application process. In normal times, they're also out in the community a lot. Mostly they have been manning our hotline, but you know, pre-COVID on average, we would get 170 calls a day. And after the pandemic hit, pretty immediately, we started getting 1,000 calls. At the peak, we were getting 1,200 calls a day from people wanting to be connected with food services. Next slide. In addition to um, the challenge being just such an immediate increase in need, we also had to really completely change our operations to be able to distribute our food more safely. So whereas usually clients walk up and select the food they want, we started pre-boxing all of the food at our warehouses. And this was at a time when initially we saw this huge drop off in corporate volunteers as people started working from home. So fortunately, the city helped us bring in the California National Guard. For a long time, we had 150 guard members spread across three of our facilities. Now we're down to 35 guard members, but the city has been really helpful in um, helping us bring in the San Jose Conservation Corps and funding that labor source, which has been really critical for our to our being able to continue to box the product. We also have more community volunteers now, and of course, at all of our distribution sites, but having this additional label, labor source has been really important. Next slide. We've also had to really expand our infrastructure, of course, to increase our food distribution by 80% in such a short amount of time. Pre-pandemic, we had 20 tractor trailers. Now we have 30 tractor trailers. We initially acquired an additional 40,000 square feet of warehouse space in San Jose that was donated by Prologis. That ran out, well, kind of running out this month and we need much more space because we have, we're bringing in so much more food now. So we're moving into a 90,000 square foot space, but that is a space that we will have to pay to lease every month. Just to give you an idea of volume, every single week we are now receiving 90 tractor trailer loads of food. If you could just visualize um, what that looks like. Next slide. We've been fortunate to be able to offer a really nutritious variety of food. At, uh, now we have, you know, pre-pandemic we had three drive-through distributions. Now we have 130. And at these drive-through distributions, people are receiving typically a 20 pound box of fresh produce with, with great variety. And then another 20 pound box of key staples like milk, eggs, pasta, rice, canned goods, tortillas. Um, we always also have a bag of frozen, um, usually meat, chicken or pork, just some sort of um, protein item. Next slide. Now I'm going to turn it over to Tracy to talk a little more about the details of our network. Yeah, we wanted to kind of deep dive a little bit on San Jose because we understood that this group had an interest in San Jose as a city. So um, we wanted to show a little bit about where our grocery distribution locations are. All the blue dots are all the varieties of locations we have, and a lot of them are right on top of each other because we really concentrate in the areas of highest need. Those green dots you see are big emergency drive-throughs that we uh, created during the pandemic. 
And one of the things that we learned in uh, actually preparing for this presentation and analysis we'd never done before is that um, although we service all of Santa Clara and all of San Mateo County, when you take a look at the food that we're distributing, over half of it is going to San Jose, the city of San Jose. If you can go to the next slide. So we have over 200 distribution sites in San Jose through 110 partners and programs. 60 of those are now drive-throughs. And this gives you some of the examples, as Neil mentioned, Mexican Heritage Plaza, and then all the big well-known um, uh, agencies you know we work with, Sacred Heart, Salvation Army, City Team, Health Trust. Um, we distribute at a lot of K-12 schools like Yerba Buena, Franklin, Luther Burbank, Jason Dahl, and colleges, uh, permanent pantry at San Jose State, but also drive-throughs at San Jose City College and Evergreen Valley. We work with tons of faith communities, both uh, Catholic and many other denominations where they distribute groceries for us. And then we also have grocery distributions at different housing complexes and community centers throughout the um, city. And as well as we work closely with meals programs like Martha's Kitchen, Loaves and Fishes, Home First and Life Moves. The other thing that uh, we have done since the pandemic is we started a grocery home delivery program. It was on our three-year plan, but except a little bit through partners, it was not something we'd done before. We're now delivering every other week to over 2,000 households in the city of San Jose. You can go to the next slide. So this is what the actual food delivered looks like. Um, as Leslie mentioned, it was about 270,000 people across both counties. Uh, in February, it's now well over 500,000, and uh, the, the actual food itself has basically doubled from around 6 million to a high of 12 million pounds in June. We're now seeing it level off, but staying at that very high level of need. So it really creates a situation where we have to figure out how to maintain this growth. And then also, as Dolan mentioned, a concern about what happens when the pandemic unemployment is taken out of people's checks when the evictions start to hit people. Will it go up again? Next slide. Um, a lot of people don't know how the food bank is funded. They think we, we get a lot of government funding. The truth is that if you look at this chart, we are primarily funded through individuals and corporations. We get about 5% of our funding from government in general. I mention this because with this kind of high level sustained need, and with a lot of people who may generally support us maybe not doing as well as they were before as well, that may not be the right model going forward. We may need to be looking to our government partners more strongly. You can go to the next slide. Eric, oh, there we go. So, you know, as we look forward, we are really working right now to figure out the plan to really sustain our response to this need. We've had to greatly increase our budget for food, um, as well as a lot of other things. We, we think we're spending about $5 million more per month than we were last fiscal year. We are also looking at how do we um, uh, consolidate our facilities, figure out a long-term plan for facilities that'll work because we're currently working across three different facilities in Santa Clara County, plus extra cold storage, plus a facility in San Mateo County. So you can imagine the logistical inefficiencies. And we are really grateful that we've had this opportunity to work with the city during the pandemic because we've gotten to know a lot of the great people who work there. And I think that uh, we're going to be working much more closely together in the future. And so we're, we're delighted to have gotten to know better how the city works and to have the opportunity to work with so many of your fantastic folks. So thank you very much. And I'm gonna pass it off to um, the Office of Ed, uh, Dr. Shemi Kareem. Hi, good afternoon, Mayor Licardo, members of council and the public. My name is Shami Kareem. I'm the Assistant Director of Human Resources for the Santa Clara County Office of Education. I'm presenting on behalf of Dr. Dewan, um, who apologizes is not able to be with us today. So on her behalf, I'd also like to thank you for the opportunity to be here today and for the partnership um, with the meals team from the city since the start of the pandemic. Um, Dr. Dewan and our schools team at the Santa Clara County EOC are very thankful um, for your leadership and for your partnership. Next slide, please. 
Since March, um, I have been serving as the meals lead for the Santa Clara County um, EOC schools team. At the start of the pandemic um, the, and the school closures, uh, school district nutrition programs had to reinvent the way that they ordered, produced, and then distributed meals to their community. Um, all nutrition leaders throughout our county really stepped up um, and the work that they did was just tremendous. Um, not only the leaders, but also their staff adapted to the new way of distributing meals and meeting the needs of the community. Our schools team supported the districts as they transitioned um, from in-class learning to distance learning. In February, staff were assigned to the Santa Clara County Emergency Operations Center um, to provide COVID-19 support countywide. Um, a schools unit team was created to support districts and serve as a liaison between the EOC, public health, and Santa Clara County school districts. Meal distribution spreadsheets were created and districts were asked to report their data daily. The data was used to determine areas of need throughout the county, and at the start of the pandemic, there were um, weekly meetings held with all county schools to share uh, public health updates, collaborate, and share best, best practices as we were all learning something new. In our partnership with the City of San Jose, um, in March, I began supporting as a liaison between the school districts and the City of San Jose meals team, who have just been fabulous in this process with us. I work directly with all of the Santa Clara County nutrition leaders as they transition to distance learning and curbside meal distributions. I also had the privilege of serving as a liaison between the City of San Jose meals team as they established their process for helping um, the community scale up food distributions to feed the most vulnerable. Um, daily meetings were held with the City of San Jose team um, as new processes and procedures were established in determining how um, to best support the community with food. As the pandemic went on, um, I continued to work with the team, the San Jose team um, to implement um, adult meals at many of our school districts, sites, and establish premise use agreements that allow the city staff to be on uh, campuses throughout the county. Next slide, please. It is always great to recognize the positives as we work through this difficult situation that we're in with the pandemic. So the amount of work that our nutrition um, departments across the county have done um, has just been immeasurable. Since April, um, our schools have served over 7.5 million meals um, to families throughout the county. The nutrition leaders and their team members have gone above and beyond of what was expected of them. They've been serving the community on the front lines since March, and we are forever thankful um, to the nutrition staff and their members. In partnership with the city of San Jose, over 820,000 additional meals, um, mostly adult meals, were served countywide. So I also want to take a moment to recognize um, our meals team with the city of San Jose that I've been working very closely with, who have just been ongoing and tireless in their efforts to meet the needs of the community and ensure there are meals available for all of our families. So the pandemic really forced us to reinvent our processes um, in serving meals and rethinking how communities can be supported with meals. As a result, uh, many partnerships and opportunities for collaboration and sharing of best practices were formed. So we came together, we worked together, and we're continuing to serve the community together. Next slide, please. As always, it's good to recognize the challenges as we move forward and to learn from them um, for the next uh, pandemic. So we have learned a great deal on how to reinvent our meals, um, meal programs to support with the pandemic. The takeaways are significant and that we will help us with future challenges that may come our way. Some of the challenges our nutrition programs faced included securing adequate PPE, ensuring the safety of their staff who were in the front line serving the meals, communicating with their families about the new ways of meal distribution and pickup, and then finding, for example, paper bags to store the meals in as they were being distributed to families. At the start of the pandemic, USDA um, was working on waivers to support districts with meal distribution. 
The COVID-19 SSO or SFSP waiver allowed school districts to distribute meals to children under 18, even if they didn't attend the school that they were picking up the meal from, or if they weren't present to pick up the meal, um, or if families were picking up meals for multiple children, and um, the districts didn't need to charge families for the meals that they were picking up. The federal waiver did expire at the start of the fall uh, school year this year. However, as of yesterday, um, USDA did provide us an extension um, through December 31st. Yes, yes, big clap for that. That was something we were working very hard towards. Um, as long as there continues to be funding, um, we will continue to operate under that waiver. This is great news uh, for our families because it ensures that we are able to distribute the same number of meals, if not more, to the community um, that we have been since the start of pandemic. Next slide, please. So as we continue to move through um, the challenges of the pandemic, we also recently um, added the fires to our list of things that um, really got in the way of families being able to access meals. So the number of families evacuating and losing their homes has increased um, over the last couple of weeks, which also resulted um, in continuing the need um, for the community to access meals. So not just in Santa Clara County, but also from Santa Cruz County who are coming over to Santa, Santa Clara County. So the school districts continue to be um, the hubs for the community and for families to rely on and to trust to pick up their meals. Um, so therefore there must, there must be um, there must continue to be resources and that's financially and through waivers um, to continue to provide meals and support to the community that we all know is very, very needed. Um, the need for waivers to continue to extend through, um, at least through uh, the 2020-2021 school year, which is all the way through June of next year. Um, so under the direction of Dr. Dewan, our office has done a lot of advocacy work around waivers and the letter, um, there was a letter sent um, and signed by Congress members that were sent to USDA um, urging them to extend the waivers for us. And this is in addition to advocacy work that is being done by a lot of partners around us in Santa Clara County as well. Um, in addition, our superintendents uh, association in Santa Clara County also um, sent a letter to delegation in DC um, asking and urging them to continue to extend the waivers. So funding, um, as for many of us, funding for nutrition programs um, continues to be an area of concern because our nutrition programs continue to lose revenue. So since the start of the pandemic, nutrition programs haven't been able to generate revenue, which normally they would be um, if schools were operating. At the same time, um, they continue to employ um, all of the staff that they had prior to COVID, even though there's, in some cases, the possibility or the need for only about half of those staff members. So um, continuing to receive um, the same amount of funding we were receiving prior to COVID and, and operating um, under COVID makes things very challenging as far as funding is concerned. Um, the districts that received adult meals through the partnership with the city of San Jose were very thankful for them and the feedback that we've received from the community is that they would love for them to continue. Um, the adult meals in um, addition to the youth meals that are served by the districts um, ensure that all of our family members who are in greatest need um, continue to have access to meals and um, we hope that our community our communities and our partnership will continue to provide the access for not only student meals, but as well as adult meals throughout the pandemic. So this concludes um, my presentation for you today. Thank you again for allowing me to be here and to present for you the information on the meals that we've been uh, distributing since the start of the pandemic. Uh, thank you so much, Shami, and thank you uh, uh, for all the partnership. I'd like to turn this over and introduce uh, Michelle Liu, uh, who is the CEO for the uh, Health Trust. Thank you, Neil. Good afternoon, Mayor Licardo and members of the council. I'm Michelle Liu, CEO at the Health Trust, and we are one of the Meals on Wheels providers in Santa Clara County, working in close partnership with the city, the county, and our sister nonprofits. The Health Trust is a longtime provider of healthy, nutritious meals delivered to homebound adults throughout Santa Clara County. 
Our meals are overseen by a registered dietitian. They are produced in the 95116 zip code. And rest assured that our board members eat the same food that we serve to our clients. Next slide, please. This chart shows the dramatic growth in meals delivered just by the Health Trust. For reference, starting at the February mark, you'll see we delivered about 4,800 meals a month up to a high of 48,000 meals in May, which included meals to residents temporarily sheltered in motels. And we've since leveled off to around 30,000 meals a month or 3.5X our pre-pandemic levels. In addition to our pre-COVID clientele of homebound isolated seniors and people with disabilities who have difficulty preparing their own meals, the Health Trust began enrolling COVID positive and other medically vulnerable adults in week one of the shelter in place. And as I just mentioned, for a few months, we were delivering meals to those temporarily sheltered in motels. I wanted to share the story of a real person. Uh, one of our newer clients, his name is Richard. He is a homebound adult who lives in an apartment complex and his apartment manager has not allowed any visitors since the shelter in place order began. While Richard did have a government caseworker who had been visiting him pre-COVID, Richard doesn't have a telephone, and since he can't have any visitors, his Meals on Wheels driver is the only person who sees Richard now. Fortunately, she is the one who's been able to keep Richard's caseworker informed about his well-being, and he's doing okay. Next slide, please. So as we look toward the future, nonprofits like the Health Trust are respectfully requesting two things. The first one is contract certainty. As the city completes your RFP processes and transitions out of countywide food distribution, we're worried that bumps in contracting could mean bumps in service. We are requesting local government contract certainty for the next 12 to 24 months to help nonprofits cover our food distribution costs. And we also hope that you'll recognize all of the excellent nonprofits who are providing pandemic meals rather than just funding a few of us. Secondly, we ask you to recognize the true costs of food distribution as you budget for nonprofit contracts. While it may make sense for the city to negotiate hard with your for-profit vendors, we are your long-term local nonprofit partners. Let's work together to maximize that FEMA reimbursement and help feed hungry residents. In closing, we want to extend our thanks to the city staff, especially Angel Rios, who has deep community wisdom and roots and respect. He has built a great team involved in food distribution. We thank you for your hard work and your unwavering focus on service, and we look forward to continued collaboration. Thank you. I will now turn the mic over to Casey Hill at Vegilution. Hey, thank you, Michelle. Um, good afternoon, council members, and Mayor Licardo, and members of the community. My name is Casey Hill. I'm the executive director of Vegilution, located in East San Jose. And I appreciate this opportunity to share a little bit about our work uh, this afternoon. At Vegilution, our six acre Urban Farm connects over 4,000 people each year through food and farming to build community in East San Jose. We grow more than 40,000 pounds of organic produce annually. We prioritize residents in the, in the Mayfair neighborhood of East San Jose, a working class immigrant community with a history of redlining and racial discrimination. Despite Mayfair residents' commitment to hard work, most people work multiple jobs. The median income is only around 28 thousand dollars annually. Residents of East San Jose have disproportionately high rates of asthma and diabetes and are experiencing a devastatingly disproportionate percentage of coronavirus cases and deaths. Even in light of these challenging circumstances, East San Jose is rich in cultural and culinary traditions and in community assets such as this, our location at Emma Pruch Farm Park. Next slide, please. Beginning the first week of shelter in place, Vegilution shifted our community engagement and environmental education programming almost entirely to food distribution through our Eastside Connect program. 
In partnership with Spade and Plow Family Farm in San Martin, and with the help of dedicated volunteers, we are currently distributing 200 boxes of local organic produce each week with home delivery to individuals who are not able to or do not feel comfortable leaving their homes. We prepare hundreds of hot meals each week featuring that same Vegilution produce for delivery to homeless and other vulnerable individuals at hotel and safe park sites. Finally, at the Vegilution farm stand, we offer organic produce grown on site at below market prices, where we also accept CalFresh EBT, as well as veggie vouchers, which are $10 coupons that we distribute to VMC pediatricians for families to redeem at the farm stand. This program is made possible in large part through our leadership of our Eastside Grown Food Entrepreneurship Program graduates. You see a few of them here in this photo. That's Yadith up in the left-hand corner. And then down below, we have our volunteers along with um, two other participants, Teresa and Cynthia. Having already completed training in food safety and preparation, packaging and customer service, these ladies were all well positioned to turn on a dime with us. The program has been a way to get food to our community while also providing safe, consistent work opportunities for East San Jose residents, most of whom have lost jobs in the service industry and have been hit hardest by the effects of the pandemic. Next slide, please. Success. So we were to tell a success story and I have to say hands down, um, the greatest factor of our success in pivoting Vegilution's program delivery strategy from community engagement and environmental education to food distribution has been our deep partnership with other grassroots place-based organizations. First and foremost, with the Si Puede Collective. The day that the shelter in place was announced, we reached out to the School of Arts and Culture, Somos Mayfair, Amigos de Guadalupe, and Grail Family Services and immediately compiled a list of East San Jose families to whom we would begin delivering food. Each agency stepped up and the result has been a truly collective impact that in addition to food, connects families to resources such as diapers and formula, PPE, arts education kits, children's books, mutual aid funding and resources about COVID-19 census voter engagement. It's a holistic approach that nourishes our community physically emotionally and economically. And our Eastside Grown Fellows have, um, have coined the term, um, protegemos los nuestros, we protect our own, we take care of our own. Uh, next slide, please. Um, challenges and opportunities, of which there are many, as we know, both challenges and opportunities. Um, rather than focus on our own small farm with equipment and staff constraints, I wanted to speak more to systems um, systems work, systems infrastructure. Um, when the city assigned the PRNS or Parks Recreation Neighborhood Services team, the huge responsibility of supporting food distribution, our decade long partnership with parks helped position Vegilution to pivot our program delivery. The produce you see in these photos, including the corn in the top right, which is actually popcorn, uh, was grown at Emma Pruch Farm Park. And the healthy, delicious cooked meals were are made from that produce and they were prepared at the lovely Gardner Community Center kitchen. So as has been mentioned before in multiple city and county forums, we have to do everything we can to invest in the food aggregation, processing and distribution infrastructure um, that is usually the bottleneck for getting food out. And I just wanted to, um, as an opportunity, um, challenge us all, including the city to explore more ways in which our non-cash community assets, whether that be physical assets such as parks, plazas, community centers, or even public employees can be further invested in, maintained and leveraged through things like reuse agreements to better support nonprofits and community residents directly in immediate and long-term food distribution efforts. So just to reiterate, all of this happens at a public park and a public community center. So um, I think that's pretty impressive. I hope you do too. <laughs> um, I wanna echo Michelle's thanks to the city staff in particular, to um, park staff, to city manager's office um, for their support. I know this has not been easy for any of us. Um, and to thank um, everyone for listening today. With that, I will pass it on to, I believe it's Nate Mook of World Central Kitchens, SourceWise. 
Great. Thank you so much, Casey. And uh, thank you, everyone, for having me um, this evening, where I am currently on the East Coast. Uh, so I will, I will be quick. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about our work with the city um, and the county. Uh, and uh, we'll then pass it off to Annalisa from SourceWise to provide some additional data and um, feedback. So a little bit of background on us. World Central Kitchen is a nonprofit organization focused on feeding people after disasters. Um, we actually have a team on the ground um, in your area right now. We've been responding to the CZU and SCU fires for the last uh, two or three weeks, um, including feeding some of the emergency shelters in San Jose itself um, in partnership with the Red Cross. So uh, that's what we typically do. Um, we respond to hurricanes, wildfires, um, emergency situations where uh, families and individuals need food uh, very quickly uh, while the systems are down. Uh, but this pandemic is certainly a different type of disaster, right? It's not a natural disaster that affects a specific area, um, but it's rather a disaster that affects everybody everywhere. Um, and I know that's been a big challenge for the city uh, as you've looked at how to um, respond. Uh, so we've also had to adapt um, and see where we could play a role uh, to support those, making sure that families don't go hungry as they're uh, out of work, um, as students are unable to go to school, um, and all of those issues that have been discussed already um, in this section. So I won't, I won't repeat all of that. I think you all understand the, the, both the severity and the complexity of the situation that we're, we're all in right now. And World Central Kitchen's work is really focused on uh, delivering chef-prepared meals. Uh, we were founded by a chef named Jose Andres uh, back in 2010, and uh, especially since 2017, have really been focusing on moving very quickly to get prepared, fresh, healthy, nutritious meals out to folks during times of crisis. Um, and with the COVID response, we've adapted this model where we typically go in and set up a large centralized kitchen somewhere, um, as we have been doing during the wildfires, producing thousands of meals, um, to a different model. Because you know, unlike a traditional disaster, with with COVID, the infrastructure is all still there. Uh, the businesses are still there. The folks aren't evacuated. Normal life is sort of you know trying to go on. And we've looked at how we can be best uh, integrated into the existing systems. Um, you know, we really believe that, uh, especially for food response, you really have to have a, uh, a complementary model that, that brings in different pieces from, from all over to make sure that you've got that coverage. Uh, we heard, obviously, from the school district and the incredible work that they've been doing. Uh, San Jose and Santa Clara are blessed to have an amazing food bank and the food that Second Harvest is, has been getting out there and the millions of pounds of food to families. And so what we do at World Central Kitchen is very complementary to that. It's making sure that um, seniors or families that don't necessarily have the ability to cook all the time um, or whatever you know, might be holding them back from doing that are also able to receive fresh, healthy meals prepared for them. Uh, and very early on, uh, we uh, were connected with, uh, with Dolan in the Office of Innovation as uh, Dolan and Neil began their work looking at, at the food response in the city and also in the county as, as San Jose took on that role. And we really identified that there was a great place for us to fit into the sort of 360 degree solution that was developed, as Dolan mentioned, in just about five weeks. Um, and, uh, and that was really focusing on getting fresh prepared meals to seniors and to COVID positive populations while also simultaneously supporting the local economy. And this is a really important aspect of, of what World Central Kitchen has been doing during our COVID response. Um, you know, we really looked at rather than us going out and setting up kitchens and cooking for folks, you had all of these restaurants that were sitting around unable to do normal business um, that may not survive the pandemic. And so we said, you know, how can we actually, instead of us cooking ourselves, how can we pay these restaurants to prepare these meals? 
Um, and so working uh, with uh, the state of California and the Great Plates Delivered program, we were able to partner with the city and the county to implement this program uh, in a very efficient and effective way in San Jose. Um, so this, we were able to get restaurants on board to prepare meals, working with delivery partners to get those meals delivered uh, twice a day, lunch and dinner to, to those individuals in need. Uh, we have, uh, we've had 15, uh, 1,500, 1,500 active participants um, in the program, uh, which, is, which has been great. So that's uh, deliveries where we've been getting those meals delivered to them. We've got nine restaurant partners on board so far with another two restaurant partners we may bring on depending on uh, how the program continues. Um, we served close to 150,000 meals from these restaurants that have been delivered to these program participants in San Jose and Santa Clara County. Um, and I think what's so amazing about this is in turn, we've been able to put $1.5 million directly back into these small businesses, um, been able to keep those businesses going. Um, and even as they've maybe been able to do takeout or delivery, you know, we all know that that's not going to keep our restaurants alive. And so this has been a really great program and a great innovative way to keep those restaurants with reliable recurring business every single day. They can hire back their workers, which would mean less folks that were unemployed and having to rely on food assistance. Um, and they could also, of course, keep paying their rent and keep their lights on and be able to keep buying from their suppliers, their local farmers um, and local suppliers. So that money really trickles down. And, and this is, you know, I think a really incredible, innovative approach um, that uh, the city of San Jose was at the forefront of. Um, and to be able to partner with, obviously, the state of California with support from, from the federal government and federal funding. So we're really excited about what we've been able to accomplish in the city and show this new model um, can work. Uh, and I think as we look towards the future, I also think it's a great way to consider how the local businesses, the local infrastructure can play a role in future crises as well that we don't always have to overcomplicate things and, and look to you know, bring a bunch of stuff from the outside or, or hire some big contractor to come in and do a job when you could support small businesses right in your backyard. And we've, you know, it's, been, it's been great to play the role of that implementer and connector so we could take that burden off the city because we're working with restaurants all over the country. So it's been, it's been a really, uh, I think, successful program so far. It continues on. Uh, we'll see uh, how, how it goes uh, into September and beyond, depending on, uh, on renewals. Um, and uh, the response from recipients, from clients who were receiving these meals has been extraordinarily positive. Um, and we've been able to really uh, improve the, the effectiveness and reach uh, folks uh, all over the county and of course, all over the city of San Jose. So I don't wanna go on too much longer, but I, I do wanna introduce um, Annalisa, our partner at SourceWise, uh, who um, was, has been an integral part of the implementation of this program. And of course has had a longstanding relationship with the, the city and county for their work on senior feeding programs. So I will pass it off to Annalisa now. And Elisa, you're on mute. Can you hear me okay? Yep. yep. Well, wonderful. Sorry about that, everyone. So oh, good afternoon, Mayor, City Council members, and members of the public. My name is Annalisa Del Pinal, and I'm the Chief Executive Officer at SourceWise. It's really a pleasure to be here today. Um, I've been asked to share just a little bit about our involvement with Great Plates Delivered Program and World Central Kitchen. So SourceWise supports World Central Kitchen by enrolling and providing supportive services to existing and potential Great Plates Delivered Program participants. And our teams are uniquely qualified to do this uh, since our agency focuses on older adults, adults with disabilities and their caregivers. So when participants do give us a call, we're 
able to enroll them over the phone or online. Um, but we're also able to provide additional resources. We have nine direct programs and services, which range from Meals on Wheels to CalFresh Expansion, Ambassador Program, Information and Awareness, and, and many more supportive services for older adults. Um, and so we're able to provide direct programs and services as well as um, find other ways to support older adults and folks that are just vulnerable in this situation. Um, so, you know, for this reason, the program really provides access to folks in a different way. Um, one of the challenges that Nate uh, mentioned was that the program gets extended about every 30 days, which means we're constantly ramping up and ramping down. So, um, you know, for that reason, we decided to do a Great Place Delivered survey so that we can really assess and understand and receive greater insight into what our clients are, clients are experiencing. Um, so with that, I just wanted to share just a few quotes. Uh, so far, we, we have received some preliminary results. Um, and the clients are telling us that the program has helped avert family crises giving us the time needed to get organized and keeping food on the table. Another client shared with us that it has allowed them to worry less about getting groceries, especially when there have been shortages. Um, another client said that the food delivery means that they don't have to expose themselves to possible exposure at grocery stores. And so once we do have the final results, we'll be happy to share those with you. Um, but so far, with the information that we've received, 88% of respondents said that they received excellent, good, or good customer service from the Great Place Delivered program. 82% um, were talking about how this program allowed them to maintain their independence. 79% of respondents either strongly agreed or agreed that overall they were satisfied with the Great Place Delivered program. And 73% of respondents strongly agreed or agreed that without the Great Place program, they would not have access to meals on a regular basis. Um, so with that, I just wanna thank the city of San Jose for all the work that you are doing to support food insecurity and make sure that the most vulnerable are getting access and also to the team at San Jose, which we speak to weekly, Jill, North, and Bautista. Uh, we really appreciate you and all that you are doing along with the World Central Kitchen team. And with that, I'm gonna go ahead and pass it on to Jill North, but I'll be available for, for any questions that you may have. Thank you for your time. Mayor, Mayor, Mayor um, if I could just step in here. I know uh, we're running short on time, so we're gonna go ahead and end the presentation here. We had a few more slides, but just uh, again, for sake of time, we'll just move to, to Q&A. Great. Thank you, Angel. Um, all right. We'll uh, go back now to public com comment on this item, which is 3.3, the San Jose food distribution update. Because of the shortness of time, we'll be uh, limited to one minute for public comment. With apologies. Uh, Joel Sterner. Welcome, sir. You will appear that uh, your device is muted right now. If you could take I, it off mute. I am there so you go. sorry. There, a technical error. Happy Tuesday. As as September 30th comes and the RFPs are running down, I just hope that we really focus on local nonprofits versus out of state. We look at the work that Martha's Kitchen, Loaves and Fishes, Hunger at Home, Team, Team San Jose has done. We have the ability to produce as many meals as needed and keep those dollars within. We hope that we can look at contracts that are a little bit more in depth than month to month, a little bit longer term. And I know there's a lot going on and during this pandemic, it's just, it's tough and recognize the true cost of what a meal takes to produce and deliver. And through all this, it, I would be remiss not to just say, Angel, oh my gosh, I can't even imagine what you're going through over there. And, and we worked with Ed, Uyan, Eric, Neil, Fabiola, um, Y'all are doing great work, and I just hope that we can consider keeping it in San Jose with the San Jose nonprofits. Thank you. Uh, Blair Beekman. Hi, thank you. Uh, in this period of COVID-19, we'll be going through in the next few years and the overall need 
for healthier diets, food storage, and food distribution, I hope we can consider the decent questions of workers' rights and human rights for people in the California Central Valley and other farming areas. It seems clear there can be an exchange of good ideas from all sides at this time, and that people from the SFA area and from large and small metropolitan areas can help share and teach good ideas of health and safety to both workers and farm owners of the Central Valley and uh, other California farming areas. As workers and farmers can learn practices and ideas to better offer quality nutritional food in the next few years, and what can become a healthier process for all of us in this time of COVID-19. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Gisela, welcome back to City Hall. Thanks, Mayor, Mayor Licardo, and uh, good afternoon, everyone uh, on the City Council. Gisela Boucher, I'm the CEO of Loaves and Fishes Family Kitchen. Just to give you an idea of the impact uh, COVID-19 has had on our organization, we ended our fiscal year uh, 2019 having served 547,000 meals, which was a huge increase for us. We ended this last fiscal year as of June 30th, having served over 1,054,000 meals. So we have nearly doubled the number of meals. And these are all hot and prepared meals that we provide to folks who don't have access to refrigeration or the ability to, um, to cook their own meals. Uh, we are, are unlike uh, some of our colleagues, our numbers continue to grow. And so we would encourage the city to bear in mind that there are many organizations like mine that are living this reality now of having to deal with folks who are struggling day after day. And uh, our numbers are not going down, they continue to trend up. So thank you for your support. We hope it continues. Thank you, Francis Wong. Hi, I'm Francis Wong, Director of Marketing and Communications for Team San Jose. Um, as many as you know, we're the economic development organization that drives the economic benefits of travel to the city. We represent Visit San Jose, and we manage and operate the San Jose McHenry Convention Center and the four San Jose theaters. Now, with the pandemic essentially halting regular business in our venues, we've shifted our efforts from conventions to coronavirus aid in partnership with the city of San Jose. We thank Kelly Hemphill and CJ Ryan of the city and the city staff who have facilitated in this regional effort of feeding those in need. Since March, we've prepared and delivered 327,000 meals to those living on site at our facilities and at locations identified by the city and county use. That's three well-balanced meals a day with one daily hot entree, seven days a week. The program has brought back 25 union local 19 staff members working 13,000 hours in our colony culinary and operations department. And as peak, we deliver 21,000 weekly meals to 22 sites. We also source locally, and we want to thank and thank and express our gratitude to the city of San Jose for giving Team San Jose the opportunity to give back to our city and remind us why we're all here doing what we do. Thank you. All right, coming back to the council, um, what we'll do is uh, we'll have uh, council questions and discussion, and then we'll wrap up for a brief uh, recess for dinner and get back to work for the evening. Uh, Councilmember Sparsa. Thank you, Mayor. I'll be quick. Um, first, I'd like to thank Councilmember Arenas for the Breastfeeding Awareness Month backgrounds. Uh, this is uh, thanks to her leadership. And with that, uh, I will also point out in the report that 9,090 cans of infant formula for those who are not able to breastfeed. So, um, I had a, I also wanted to thank our partners, the food bank, county office of education, um, the health trust, veggie lucian, uh, source wise and uh, Catholic charities uh, for all of their work every single day in our communities. Um, we have found how uh, critical and life saving this work really is. Um, I had a couple of questions. One is, oh, and I also wanted to particularly thank um, the food bank and the Mexican consulate for partnering with us at the Mexican Heritage Plaza. I think it's a really unique site um, and through the partnership with the consulate um, is, uh, is really important in the east side in having a welcoming place for people to go at a time when so many are afraid. Um, so two questions. One is, how are we looking at addressing gaps 
um, and uh, including uh, culturally appropriate foods. So geographic gaps and culturally appropriate foods. I have heard from many in the Vietnamese community who um, who are looking for culturally appropriate food um, to feed their families. Yeah, yeah council member, that's a, you know, that's, that's a, that's a really important um, aspect of this work. Uh, you know, you know, for starters, our immediate response is is is, is basically getting food of, of any type, of course, high in quality to to individuals, and then and then you know, as we kind of mature in this, and as we kind of continue to go, we're able to kind of customize and pivot according to neighborhood and 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 source, right? Um, you know, but this is an issue that we have framed as you know, we are starting to ramp up around our transition from the city over to the county. Uh, you know, September 30th will be the last, uh, we'll be officially transitioning this over to the county with the exception of San Jose. We'll still take responsibility of the city of San Jose through the end of December. But we've been identifying various policy issues, decision points that we really need to address uh, countywide lessons learned. Uh, um, and that's one of the, that's one of the examples or that's one of the, the, uh, the issues that we have identified. Uh, for this transition team, because we know it's important, um, but uh, more, more to come on that. Thank you. Thank you for recognizing the importance of that. I just wanted to say from the food bank that that's certainly um, something we are always very conscious of, and we've had a big focus on fresh produce, so about half of what we distribute is fresh produce, and we try to source as many kind of universally uh, acceptable items, things like eggs um, as we can, but we continue to look for ways to source more items. As you might imagine, there's been so much, such a big challenge just bringing in the sheer volume of food we need right now and so many supply chain disruptions. That's something our sourcing team continues to look at. Thank you, appreciate that. Um, and then also you mentioned volunteers that we are mobilizing large groups of volunteers. Um, I just shared some information about Catholic Charities who's looking for volunteers. And so I know it's, um, it's a challenge to come up with the support at so many distribution sites. Um, and how can we support these food distribution sites as a community to ensure that there are enough volunteers for all of the food distributions? Yeah. I think oh, it's, I uh, oh, sorry, did you wanna go ahead? Yeah. Uh, the well, yeah, I mean, Angel, it, it, could you go ahead? Thank you. Yeah, yeah I was going to mention that, you know, uh, one, of the, one of the resources that we used that turned out proved to be very effective was, was within the first, uh, you know, seven to 10 days, uh, the SiliconValleyStrong.org website went online. And to date, we have uh, deployed over 6,000 volunteers to very, primarily various nonprofit partners. Uh, and, and, and it's unique because we've been able to do that in partnership also with Silicon Valley Council of Nonprofits. So as we secured PP&E and supplies uh, through the EOC, we were able to, to work with Silicon Valley Council of Nonprofits to, to distribute them to nonprofits who then also would help uh, provide these to the organizations where we're deploying the volunteer, where we, where we were deploying the volunteers. And so that all kind of worked together pretty well. Um, going forward, uh, clearly, uh, people in our city are rising to the occasion, and there's definitely, I mean, even with COVID, I mean, even when you think about the numbers in terms of kind of putting themselves in harm's way around, you know, just showing up, you know, during a pandemic, these numbers are pretty impressive when, you know, when you think of 6,051 to date, right? But uh, so, uh, again, in the, in the spirit of transition and in the spirit of how do we sustain this, we're looking at how do we how do we sustain that 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 community force and how do we grow it because we're not going to be able to just spend our way through this we're going to have to find other ways to make this sustainable long term and volunteers has to be a big part of it thank you and i wanted to go back to geographic gaps because west evergreen has a gap um, and it's a largely vietnamese and latino community um, that's kind of geographically isolated a little bit um, and so I just want to ask that we provide that sort of geographic support to, um, to West Evergreen uh, and really look at that area. Um, and then really quick, are, are there any nonprofits providing COVID, uh, food, COVID related food assistance who are not being supported by the city? Uh, yeah, d definitely there are. I mean, it, when, when you when you take a look at kind of the list of all our nonprofit partners, it's a pretty impressive, pretty significant list. 
but there are a number of faith, uh, faith-based uh, organizations, uh, smaller nonprofits uh, throughout the city that aren't even officially or formally through uh, in- involved with this network. Informally in that we've provided a lot of them PP&E and supplies and, and uh, support with, for example, traffic control and things like that. But clearly there are many organizations that are providing this resource uh, and not receiving city funding. Uh, that, that would be correct. Oh, okay, thank you. I know, like, for example, Cathedral of Faith gets tremendous support from the city and the food bank. They're a strong partner of the food bank. And I think they're still the largest food distribution in the city, right? I mean, if not the largest, they're one of the largest. Um, it's pretty impressive. All right, that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, just to build on something Council Member Sparza referred to, first, I want to thank all of our partners uh, who have been so deeply engaged in this work. And, and Leslie, thanks for all the heavy lifting Second Harvest has been doing for years. And, and all of you have been. In addition to our funded partners, though, we have unfunded partners out there who are feeding an awful lot of our residents. Uh, Loaves and Fishes, Martha's Kitchen, I think African American Community Services Agency, uh, School of Arts and, 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 and Culture, and others. And I guess the question is, um, if, if these are organizations that can get FEMA, can do FEMA eligible work, uh, what does that mean for us? Is that a 25% reimbursement? Is, is that what we need to go find money for if we wanted to try to expand? You, you know, from a fiscal standpoint, it's very situational, right? Because what we have to kind of start with is, you know, kind of our three overarching goals. The first one is feeding the most vulnerable, right? And and then that we have to kind of unpack that a little bit more around really defining vulnerable and then the connection between being vulnerable and COVID, right? And so, um, so you know, t- typically that can, you know, a good match could result in a 75% reimbursement in a 25% unfunded gap. Right. And so one of the things that we did was we really focused really first and foremost with our goal number two, which was really maximizing existing food networks, starting with the people that were already doing this, the networks, that were, the infrastructure that was already in place. And then as and making sure that they're strong and healthy and serving the community. And then we started looking for gaps. Right. Um, and so so I think that strategy has paid off pretty well because we've been able to kind of be very responsible around the how we're, we're, we're managing the, the resources that we have, especially since we're doing this kind of at the same time with a lot of unknowns, right? Not really sure about FEMA reimbursement completely, not really sure about all the parameters around uh, uh, the coronavirus relief fund. Um, and so, but going forward, the, the one thing that I think we all collectively agree on is that there's a need for number one, uh, intentional countywide coordination that addresses food resiliency. And, and food gaps, number one, and then number two, a sustainable funding source and an intentional funding source. Because, uh, you know, I think in, in some ways the blessing in disguise is that we got the coronavirus funding. We got, you know, we were able to respond very quickly. But the reality is that this need existed even pre COVID, it was just exacerbated through COVID, right? So, you know, I, Mayor, I think the question that you're asking and the one that the council member asked before, I think really are, are those questions that we're trying to grapple with to make this sustainable long-term post-COVID. Um, we don't have all the answers yet, but uh, we have to find a way to fund this because the need is definitely there. Okay, thanks, Angel. And then last question. I, I, I had heard from a few organizations, real challenges getting the money out um, of City Hall. And I'm just wondering, have we, have we worked through some of the, the bumps in the process to see attorney's office finance, et cetera, in terms of being able to get the money in the hands of the nonprofits? I think we definitely have cracked that nut, you know, uh, you know, for, for sure er, early on, we definitely had some issues because, you know, keep in mind, we we're trying to set up a, a system, trying to enter into contracts, and then also trying to get money out at the same time that we're, we're kind of, you know, building this, this system. Uh, we did have some challenges early on. I think we worked those out. I think Neil and his team, Dolan, and, and you know, b- behind Dolan, Neil, myself, and others that, that you see on the screen, we have this amazing, uh, you know, group of city workers and then all, as well as our partners and nonprofits that have really stepped up in a very smart way to kind of get this stuff resolved. So I think we, we got a good handle on that, Mayor. Everybody's getting uh, checks and, and paid. Uh, so I think we finally have a good handle on that. If I could just add a couple of things from the um, EOC perspective to build on to what Angel said. You know, one thing to remind everybody on the FEMA reimbursement, FEMA has chosen to take an extremely narrow vision of what is reimbursable around food during this crisis. Uh, One that I I think is unconscionably narrow personally. 
Um, yeah. You wouldn't. Uh, so uh, it, it's it's, a, it's extremely restricted. Second thing that we've we've learned, and nobody necessarily wants to think about uh, the next crisis, but as a professional paranoid, that's that's part of what we do. Um, two things that we need to do differently within our city operation to make sure that we are ready for the next one is one is we need to have a set of a policy around what are our procurement approaches during an emergency, because we are allowed to have a different set of procurement approaches, but we're not allowed to just make them up in emergency. So we have to have them pre-approved. So that's one of the things we'll be doing to bring to you. The other is to have uh, pre-existing contracts in place with major partners like Second Harvest, who we simply know we're going to need to want to work with, um, regardless of what the type of emergency is. So I, I um, I really want to thank in particular Second Harvest and others for their extreme patience with us and, and their ability to educate us and help build the team out. I think we're there now as partners, but you know this was a huge learning piece for us. And, and two of the key learnings that we're going to bring back to the council are we need to have a different set of procedures for procurement in an emergency than our normal ones. And we need to spend a lot of time with probably about you know uh, 50 different organizations coming up with pre-contracts for the next emergency, wh whether it's an earthquake or whether it's another pandemic. Thanks, Kip. And thank you for reminding me. I'd forgotten about how uh, how very narrow, uh, narrowly FEMA had um, confined reimbursement on food. Uh, so I know that's been a huge challenge for us. And I just want to offer a huge thank you again to our partners, but also to our internal team. Uh, I think this has really been a stellar example of nimble work that has drawn from just the best spirit of, of, of our city team and innovation has just been incredible. So thank you to Dolan and to Angel and to Neil and, and Andrea and everybody who's worked so hard on this. Uh, Councilmember Davis. I want to echo those thanks. I heard the word pivot, I think, from every single person who, who presented today. And it clearly... Uh, happened very quickly and, and it, I, it all came together very, very well. Um, and I, I do want to add my thanks to, to um, Dolan and Neil and, and the whole team and all of our partners. It's, it's really been, uh, we've, we've watched it every Tuesday, getting the number of meals that have been delivered in the previous week, just go up and up and up. Um, I do have one question and I, I appreciate the, um, the conversation about um, culturally appropriate meals. And I did have a question. It's especially top of mind because it is Breastfeeding Awareness Month. And so we're thinking about that today, about special dietary needs, especially for pregnant and breastfeeding women and maybe those with allergies or intolerances or even diabetics. How do we, when we get those questions, do we send them to a specific place or how does that how does that get dealt with in this in the food distribution program yeah, yeah that, that that's a tough one because that kind of falls in the area of you know how we customize uh meals and, and in in a lot of cases we're not able to do that right uh, i think we what we've done is we prioritize customization of meals especially as it relates to people that are unhoused and are quarantined uh, due to medical conditions that require a specific uh, diet uh, that we, you know, Team San Jose has been really good at that, uh, Hunger at Home uh, has been good at that. In terms of the issue that you raised, I think that, that I would put that in the category of we could do it kind of situationally, um, but that's probably something that we should probably do a deeper dive on to see how we could better customize uh, that type of, uh, of, of, of an issue because, um, you know, quite frankly, I don't think we're really set up to respond to it as effectively as we probably should. So, hey, Angel, and just uh, I agree with what you said, but we, we do have a few more programs. So the Great Plates Delivered actually as the menu selection that Annalise's team at SourceWise, they, they take into consider both um, cultural preferences and dietary preferences. So we have vegetarian, we have Asian, we have low sodium, we have gluten free um, and probably others that I'm forgetting. Uh, we also do the same thing with our, um, our kind of uh, it, private sector uh, relationship, we stood up day one between Mod Pizza and DoorDash, as Mod Pizza had uh, um, uh, dietary considerations as well. And so as we had to use those to pinch hit when we had a six o'clock call that a homeless placement had been made and there are 30 people who need food, we were able to uh, give them dietary options as well. But on a large scale, we, we have, as, as Angel said, that's something we need to look at for the next next set of improvements. 
that's very helpful. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Pros. Yeah, I'll, I'll be brief as well. Um, I just wanted to, to offer my my thanks to all of our partners that um, have helped the city through uh, a certainly very challenging uh, task, uh, but an honorable task at that. I know that staff knows I've criticized along the way in regards to us maybe biting off more than we can chew, uh, no pun intended in regards to the food service, but the reality is, is that um, you know, I think we, we did what we knew had to be done, even though we knew we weren't going to be great at it. And we actually turned out pretty, pretty darn good. Um, and it was really because of the, I think the partnerships that we created, not trying to go out there and, and reinvent the wheel, but working with all the partner agencies, um, and, and attempting to do our part to coordinate a lot of city staff that had not done work like this before, uh, that stepped up. And, um, and, and really, uh, I think today was a, was a nice uh, way to present from all of our partners um, that we know that have been out there serving these individuals, serving our community that has been uh, so in need of a, the, the basic um, element of food, um, nutrition. And, uh, and so just wanted to, to offer my thanks to everybody, uh, the, the nonprofit partners and, and all the city staff. Thank you, Councilman Reyes. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I'm sorry. So I had a question about. Um, uh, thank you for bringing up the, the the questions around um, the reimbursement rate, uh, and so it, it answers that my my um, my curiosity about why we weren't um, getting more reimbursed. Um, the question that I had was around the isolated seniors. I know that this was an increase. Um, how, how is that need getting met? Um, because if they're isolated, who are they letting know how, what, what is our source? And if we know folks in our community through our neighborhood associations, how, how can we funnel um, these seniors? Uh, yeah, that, that, that's been a real challenge. You know, you know, I think, you know, the main way that we've been able to really serve seniors that fall into that category is really through our senior congregate meal uh, sites. And, you know, we have 12 uh, existing through the city of San Jose, and then there's about another uh, several countywide. Uh, and, and we definitely saw increases in senior congregate meals. Um, at the same time, the same seniors that use that service are also seniors that tend to be be more alone or sometimes live more independently. Uh, in addition to that program, the Great Place program really hones in on vulnerable seniors that oftentimes live alone or live with somebody that is just as impoverished as they are. When you take a look at the eligibility requirements, you gotta be like 600% of federal gu poverty guidelines. So th th those, those are the ways that we've at least been able to identify. And quite frankly, and sadly, sometimes the only interaction is at that point of food distribution. Um, I think it's a challenge that we still need to address. It, it goes a little bit beyond the purview of food distribution, but I know Neil and his team through gerontology in, in, in Parks and Rec, working with the Office on Aging uh, and Aging Services countywide, they have really elevated that issue as, you know, especially during COVID, how do we get to seniors that are isolated? Because it's a bit counterintuitive, right? We, you know, on the one hand, COVID, response says shelter in place and kind of isolate yourself. And at the same time, that very isolation is detrimental to their health, right? So, um, Neil, I don't know if you want to share anything else. I know you've been very active in, in this area. I would just say, I mean, the uh, traditional effort for um, homebound uh, seniors is definitely our partners who do the Meals on Meals programs. So Health Trust, uh, SourceWise, uh, they have an uh, intake system uh, that they will take uh, any uh, any calls from from residents uh, who have a senior that they're aware of who's isolated, um, as you heard before, both the agencies uh, have increased well beyond uh, their numbers uh, prior to COVID, and that was definitely not just uh, referrals from the city that was uh, need across across the board. So uh, definitely uh, health trust and source wise as the uh, most isolated uh, support uh, families can call there. Uh, and did you notice this this need in a particular area, or was this just in general all, all across our city? Michelle, you may want to take uh, kind of that question, just on where you've seen your needs across for isolated seniors. For Neil, 
We have seen increases throughout the county, but primarily in San Jose. Um, we have looked at uh, growth by zip code, and I would say, not surprisingly, the areas around downtown San Jose and East San Jose um, stand out. But we do encourage anyone who needs a meal or has questions about getting meals on wheels to just call our number at 408-961-9870. We have a multilingual team ready to answer the phone. Wonderful. Maybe if you can repeat that number once again and we can all uh, post it on our social media. Sure. So probably the easiest number for everyone to remember is just 211. They will get Meals on Wheels routed appropriately. Or Thanks. locally, you can call the Health Trust at 408-961-9870. Thank you, Council Member. Awesome. Thank you so much, um, Michelle and Angel um, and Neil. Um, so my, my, uh, my concern was that not all of our seniors were um, receiving the connection that, that, that they may need. And so um, one, of the, one of the suggestions I have, and I know I'm just adding something to your plate, but you can decide whether it's a, a, an effective strategy. I know that a lot of our churches um, have a lot of volunteers that are willing and able to do many things. Um, like I mentioned earlier today, one of our churches has kind of taken over one of our, our food distributions, our monthly food distributions in terms of volunteers. And I wonder if we can um, incorporate them into our efforts as well as any other city um, initiatives that we ha have, like the age-friendly initiative. Um, so that way it makes sense even after COVID ends um, so that it's integrated into what we're doing, where we're heading. I would just like to mention that the food bank is um, providing home delivered groceries to seniors. Of course, we saw a huge increase in need during the pandemic and we're now delivering to over 6,000 seniors across both counties. And we've been doing that in partnership with Catholic Charities in Santa Clara County, but we are looking at ways to expand that to individual volunteers. So um, always if folks would go to our website, both they can call our food connection hotline to get connected to groceries or they can go to our website to volunteer to be a home delivery person. Wonderful, I, I, I thank, thank you so much. I don't know if there's, there's going to be maybe a concerted effort on uh, focusing um, on seniors and that way those folks who um, that calls them and that's and propels them to, to volunteer, that might be an area where they really want to invest more of their time. Please count on my office to, to be part of whatever strategy you decide, but I think that we also need to bring in the resources that we have already in our community and then um, just maximize whatever other efforts were already, already taking place, especially with our age-friendly initiative. Um, those are my questions. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, Councilman Crosco. Hi there. Um, I was hoping to have my breastfeeding background up, but I'm very unsuccessful. And I wanted to join in solidarity with all my female counterparts, as well as my other female in, in, uh, in spirit. Uh, but um, happy breastfeeding month to everybody. So I, I just, you know, I wanted more than anything to thank all of the partners who have been so great and stepping in and partnering and being such great allies in such a very difficult time. I, I've said this before, and I just wanna really repeat um, some of the experiences that we've had in District 5 where we've had families uh, uh, literally outside of my, where I live, outside of my door almost, uh, a line that has spanned uh, uh, blocks and where people have, have um, sat in their car for almost three hours. And, you know, I'm almost, I'm almost embarrassed to say what a blessing it's been for me not to sit in the line for three hours. Uh, you know, and so that's the district that I represent. And Casey knows this all too well uh, because she is uh, 
such has been such a great partner in uh, in in the work that she does at Emma Push Park, and uh, serves the same residents that I do, and of course sees the need. Uh, so uh, I, I'm just very very grateful. Uh, and I've said this before: you stepped in at a time when uh, the world called you to do so, and. Um, and all my colleagues have asked some of the most important questions, reimbursement, uh, the cost, what else do we need to do? I need to express to you my utmost gratitude because people went hungry in a way that I could not imagine our own residents uh, experiencing this. The world literally changed from one day to the next in a way that I, it was unfathomable to me. When we suddenly locked down and the economy closed up, for some, we continued to live relatively normal lives because as long as we continue to have direct deposit, mm, the inconvenience of just staying home is simply just an inconvenience. But for others, it was scrambling for for a bag of oatmeal and for a gallon of milk. And you allowed uh, these families to have some, some semblance of peace. And I say semblance because I, they still don't have it until we reopen the economy and we get children back to school and we figure out what COVID is going to eventually do to all of us. <clears throat> and we don't know yet, it's a mystery. And uh, later on uh, with the assistance of some uh, real brainiacs that I had an honor to serve on a task force for a brief moment in time, we'll be presenting some recommendations, uh, but uh, we're hoping to be able to protect and to safeguard our residents in the city and in the county, but uh, but we, you know COVID is here to stay for a while, and uh, and so we'll have to really think through how we will be providing for our residents in terms of their safety, but in terms of how we fill bellies, uh, and and be able to just provide just the basic necessities, just the basic necessities. So so I want to thank you for for the work that you've done, and I know that. Um, that it, it takes a lot, in my opinion, sometimes to inspire a team to change and pivot and to do things that they weren't expected to do and to sometimes do it under very, very stressful conditions. It's hot outside. It's a heat wave. It's a fire. God forbid something else is going to come, but it's a contagious disease. And people are scared, including our workers. And so I, I really appreciate the work that you've done. And I really appreciate that you've been able to feed the number of people that, uh, that you were feeding and, uh, and taking care of the paperwork that I know that I couldn't take care of, but uh, the logistics that it took to take care of the number of people that you've been taking care of. Uh, I know that it is a monumental feat. I know that it is because I see the lines outside my door. I see it. And so I'm very, very grateful. I'm very grateful. And, and, that, and that's, that's it for me. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Foley. Thank you, Mayor. It's appropriate that we have this update during Breastfeeding Awareness Month as there is no more nutritious source of food and sustenance than that. Thank you to Council Member Arenas for mention for being there to honor Breastfeeding Awareness Month. And I see two men with their banners as Breastfeeding Awareness. So kudos to you as well. I don't have any questions because those have already been asked and answered. The report was really extensive. I truly appreciate all the work of our food distribution partners and the variety of healthy foods and opportunities that our, our residents have to get food delivered to them, to pick up food, the fresh produce, 
Vegilution, every one of you is really doing a heavy lift, a much heavier lift than you had last year, I know, and not just a, a heavy lift fisc uh, uh, to provide food, but financially it's a heavy lift as well. So we stand in solidarity with you and appreciate all that you do. Thank you for that. That's all I have to say. Thank you. All right, thank you. I believe uh, we, do we need to, to vote here, Nora, or is this a, we're just receiving a report? My understanding is you're just receiving the report. Okay, great. Thanks everybody for the update and thanks for all the great work. Let's keep doing great work. All right, we, uh, we are now uh, almost at six o'clock. Let's, uh, let's take a recess until six. Mayor, yes. did we do consent? No, we have not. That's going to be next. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> so Thank you. That is exactly what we face. So let me <laughs> sound the two minute drill now. Uh, we'll have uh, about five and a half hours starting at 630 to get this wrapped up before the midnight deadline. Uh, so that means we'll all have to be on our best behavior. All right. Thank you all. Let's take a break till 630.